Okay, Would they're gonna to see them. See all these people are on and like see it says Ann Washington right here. Uh-huh. So just like Ron Lucy, but let's mute ourselves. Please mute your microphones, panelists. Thank you. Gave us, we'd like four copies. Oh, okay. Do you need more, I think? Um, no, there's just a few of us. Yeah, just a few of us. Thank you. All panelists, please turn your videos off and your microphones off until we get started. Thank you. And panelists, even when we get started, if you're not one of this, if you're not the speaker, please have your microphone muted as well as your video camera. Many of you are listed as panelists, but uh, have chosen to have a video uh, that uh, is going to be your presentation. but when you logged in, you logged in as a panelist. We just want to let you know that when you're talking, if you have your uh, microphone and video on, all 1,000 participants will hear you. So, uh. so 
set up here on me. Okay, in just a minute, we're going to get started. And when we do, we're going to be recording uh, this program. So just letting everybody know that uh, when we get started, we will be recording. Randy, checking in with you. Is everything ready to go? Yes, sir. Everything's ready. All right. Hey, Randy, hello. Hello. I'm so excited. So today we're doing the, the okay, please yeah. mute your vi audio. Some panelist has their audio turned on. Please mute your audio. Randy, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure if you can see the Yes, we can see the flag and we can hear you. Okay, thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ron Lucy. I'm the executive director of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome all of you to the uh, Texas ADA 30 Americans with Disabilities Act celebration. As we get started, I want to encourage all of our panelists to make sure you have your microphones and video cameras muted. I want to let everybody know that we have real-time captioning available at the bottom of the screen and an American Sign Language interpreter and audio description for our participants who are blind. All right, first up on our program, I would like to ask you to help me in joining our disabled American veterans with a flag ceremony and color guard presentation and singing of the national anthem uh, by Irene Telioaga. Uh, the flag ceremony has been brought to us by the disabled American veterans Lone Star chapter number four from Austin, Texas. Irene. Irene, your mic is muted. Hello. All right, we can hear you, Irene. Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight last glimmer, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous for the records we watch were so carefully streamed and the rock is red, red, the bombs 
Thank you very much, Irene. That was beautiful. And thank you very much to the uh, Disabled American Veterans Lone Star Chapter number four out of Austin, Texas. All right, coming up next uh, is uh, somebody who needs no introduction. Uh, we're going to hear from Governor Greg Abbott, who will present us with the Americans with Disabilities Act 30th Anniversary Proclamation. Please join me in hearing from Governor Greg Abbott. All right, we got to hit the pause button. We uh, don't have the audio. President George H.W. Bush signed the... Um... Uh, this is Governor Greg Abbott. On this, the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I've issued this proclamation. It says in 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law calling it a long overdue Independence Day for Americans with disabilities. On the 30th anniversary of the passage of this landmark legislation, I encourage all Texans to reflect on our past achievements, as well as remain focused on the work that remains before us to create a fully inclusive and accessible state for Texans with disabilities. Through continued commitment to fairness an equal opportunity, we can empower all Texans to rise above their circumstances and achieve their dreams. We'll do it together. I love that ending, we'll do it together, which embodies for me the spirit of this year's Americans with Disabilities Act celebration. All right, first up, our speaker this morning comes from the Texas Department of Transportation, the lead agency for planning our ADA 30 celebration. The Texas Department of Transportation's mission is connecting you with Texas. This forward thinking agency is led by their executive director, James Bass, who has been the executive director since 2016. Please join me in welcoming Director Bass. Thank you and good morning. Thank you for having me at this Texas size recognition of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And thank you to the coordinators of this milestone event who represent passionate advocates for people with disabilities, state agencies, and local communities from all across Texas. Today's event offers a powerhouse lineup of perspectives. These inspiring speakers will share their experience with the ADA, including what it was like to see it implemented, how it has furthered the civil rights of Americans with disabilities, and how we can work together to continue to move forward. Our mission at TechSot is connecting you with Texas to the places and opportunities that are important to you via our transportation system. And TechSot works to ensure accessibility to all of our facilities, programs, and services. These efforts include updating our ADA transition plan that will guide the department's efforts to further remove barriers, expanding outreach and awareness activities around this issue, including internal and external trainings, improving access at public meetings, such as those required to implement a new highway project or those of our Texas Transportation Commission, and enhancing web accessibility standards to ensure that anyone can easily locate and utilize information on the department's website. We will continue to expand our partnerships with disability advocacy groups and other stakeholders, including cities, counties, 
and transit authorities who share the common interest to improve and increase accessibility for all. These powerful partnerships will better assist our customers and strengthen the communities that we serve. We are honored to be a part of this important conversation today and into the future. Thank you. Director Bass, I wanna thank you for those remarks and most of all to thank you for uh, lending your team to the state of Texas for leading the planning of this event. It's been an honor for me and my team to work with the Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, leadership starts at the top and uh, your uh, leadership tone has been exemplified by the great work of your staff. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we're gonna hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Lex Frieden. Dr. Frieden is Professor of Health Inform Informatics and Rehabilitation at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, uh, and also Director of the Independent Living Research Utilization Program, ILRU at TIRR Memorial Hermann Hospital in Houston. And he is regarded as the architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, I needed a little bit of help in introducing Dr. Frieden, so we dipped into our archives and found this introduction from President George H.W. Bush. Let's hear from President Bush. I met Lex Frieden before I served our nation as president. His input and his counsel helped produce the original draft of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and he was right there with me when as president. I was privileged to sign the ADA into law. You know, Lex has made a huge impact on our nation's disability communities. And by gracious and humble example, he's helped our nation. He's helped it understand that people with disabilities not only deserve, but are guaranteed equal rights to access, employment, and all the opportunities every American has. Lex, welcome. Thank you, Ron, and uh, welcome to all of you today to this uh, 30th anniversary of the ADA passage, and uh, we're doing it Texas style today. The uh, ADA actually enabled all of us to have access to places we never thought we could get. And I say that because many of us sat around the table years ago talking about how Texas might be ahead of the nation. And that happened because Texas leadership stepped forward. A lot of my colleagues who are probably here on the line today took part in advancements that we made in the 1970s in Texas. Uh, we were able to work with the state legislature, with the office of the governor, and with communities all over the state to implement accessibility standards that existed nowhere else in the United States. We did this because we had able leadership. Uh, we met early in 1977 in Houston, Bob Kafka, Bob Geyer, Pat Pound, Ralph White, Larry Johnson, and a plethora of others met in Houston and talked about how we could build a coalition of advocacy. And we put together what is now the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities. I think Pat was the founding president of CTD. And from there, we began to educate, to develop, to frame leadership, to empower people with disabilities across the state. In 1989, the United States Congress asked Texas to sponsor one of the only field hearings that was held outside Washington as the ADA was being considered by Congress. Steve Bartlett, representative from Dallas, Texas, came with Major Owens, 
Major Owens was chairman of the committee that was responsible for moving the ADA through the House of Representatives. Members of the Congress came to Houston on that morning to hear testimony from Texans, more than 500 people with disabilities, advocates, family members, parents and friends came to the Houston Multi-Service Center to voice their support of a law preventing discrimination on the basis of disability. Well, we're not able to prevent discrimination, but we were able to voice our need for freedom of access, for universal accessibility, for equal opportunity. We did that for 12 hours on that day. And Steve Bartlett, the Dallas representative who came to Houston with the idea that the ADA might not be the vehicle for promoting independence and opportunity for people with disabilities, left here with the promise that he would lead Republicans to support the bill in the House of Representatives. And he did that. Other Texans who were significant in the Congress at the time included Jack Brooks from Beaumont. Congressman Brooks led one of the key committees in the House of Representatives, the committee that dealt with civil rights matters. And Congressman Brooks was not entirely in support of the ADA bill. His committee had to pass the bill in order for it to get to the floor of the House of Representatives. Congressman Brooks heard from Texans with disabilities. At first, he wasn't sure that ADA was a civil rights bill like the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He wasn't sure that people with disabilities faced the same kind of discrimination as people of color or women or other protected classes. And after he heard from Texans with disabilities, Congressman Brooks flipped. Members of his committee who were against the ADA saw his change in approach. And in fact, they learned that he was serious about it when on the morning that the ADA was supposed to be considered by his committee, he feared that a majority of the members might not vote to support the ADA. So he told the Sergeant at Arms to lock the doors on the hearing room. And he told the members that no one will leave this room until they have made a vote in favor of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And guess what? they voted in favor of the bill and it went to the House of Representatives and it passed and it passed the Senate by an historic margin and President Bush signed the bill into law July 26, 1990. We can all be thankful for people like Bob and Pat and Larry and the other great advocates who started in the 1970s, started along with a, a convert that we brought from Japan, as a matter of fact, and that was Justin Dart, who moved to Austin and became educated by Texans with disabilities, and he became one of the greatest outspoken leaders of the disability movement in the 1980s, a real Texan. So we can be proud of the efforts of the coalition. We can be proud of our mentor, Justin Dart. We can be proud of the efforts that we have all made together as Texans with disabilities. We can be thankful for the progress that we have made, but we have more to do. Today in Texas, there are thousands of people living in nursing homes and other institutions who are at risk of the pandemic. 
coronavirus is alive and well in Texas nursing homes. And hundreds and thousands of our colleagues are stuck there because there is not sufficient affordable, accessible housing in our communities. We have work to do. Hundreds and thousands of Texans with disabilities and older adults are stuck in nursing homes and institutions in Texas because we do not have a statewide community by community infrastructure of services and supports for people with disabilities in our state. Oh yes, we have some demonstration programs and people from other states use Texas as a model, but those programs only serve a few dozen of us and we need statewide municipal programs that will enable us to live independently in the community, to age in place, and to be full participants throughout our lifespan. I don't say this is a national issue. For us, it's a Texas issue. We have great leadership today. Ron Lucy, the governor's committee, have done amazing works. The members of the committee staff and the board are super leaders. We've put together this great celebration of the ADA and we all have much to do. We have to fall in and get to work again, just like we did in the 1970s and the 1980s before the ADA passed. Let's make Texas not only a fully accessible state, but let's make Texas a place where people with disabilities can live and work without fear of discrimination, a state where we will have equal opportunity for employment, as well as for living in the community without the need to go to an institution because we need a roof over our heads, three meals a day, and somebody to help us get dressed and undressed and help with other activities of daily living. We need to ensure our movement includes people with all sorts of disabilities, people with mobility impairments, sensory impairments, cognitive impairments, intellectual impairments, psychiatric disabilities, and every person who experiences discrimination on the basis of disability should be a part of our movement. We need to reach out to them and together, Texas will live the vision that George Herbert Walker Bush had when he signed the Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years ago. Happy 8830 Texans with Disabilities. Thank you very much, Dr. Frieden. Up next, we're going to hear from one of those leaders and advocates that uh, Lex Frieden spoke about, uh, Mr. Bob Kafka. Bob is an organizer with ADAPT. Uh, he has been a disability rights advocate and grassroots community organizer for over 40 years. His work with, the, uh, with ADAPT and Rev of Texas has been based on his philosophy that people power will bring about social change. When we talk about titles, uh, Bob's informal title related to the ADA is Godfather of the ADA, which seems appropriate given that he's originally from the Northeast. Please join me in welcoming Bob Kafka. Reviewing Randy Turner GCPD staffs alert the shared content is fit to your screen. Okay, somebody needs to mute their microphone. The original size. Click original size in the alert you are using the computer audio. Alert you second. are in the webinar hosted by Randy Turner GCPD. Hold on. All right. There we go. Bob, are you ready? Yeah. Thanks, Ron. And sure. uh, um, it seems that I'm always following Lex. Uh, uh, I don't have a president introducing me, but uh, I have been an activist for always 40 years. And uh, Lex uh, sort of triggered some memories of how I became an activist and involved in 
obviously the passage of the ADA. Um, it started in Houston uh, with a local grassroots organization called the Coalition for Barrier Free Living. Um, and I also was involved with the Texas Paralyzed Veterans there in Houston. Um, from there, I got involved and went to that meeting that Lex talked about. And one thing that is never mentioned uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s was a national group called the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities that helped develop a lot of the state coalitions that many of them don't exist any longer. CTD, the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, is one of the few that still survive and it's people in Texas should be proud that we have kept that state kind of focus. You know, I got involved with the DAP in 1984. Um, you know, I was basically a policy wonk by, by nature uh, and sometimes trending towards bureaucracy. <clears throat> what DAP sort of taught me is that um, rights are never given that you have to fight for those rights. Um, we've seen over the years uh, attacks on the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, in fact, many uh, have said that it was the worst bill ever signed by President George H.W. Bush. Uh, there continues to be attacks. And so we, we can't be uh, too complacent uh, because he who giveth can take it away. And I think it's very important that we keep that grassroots energy that really got the ADA. Um, I want to recognize, and many of the people who was on there, are names that won't get their picture, or they won't get their names in the books. But there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people whose names you'll never hear, you'll never see. And they really made what happened in the ADA. Uh, my memory uh, of the passage of the ADA, many of you may have seen what was called the Capitol Crawl uh, when uh, ADAPT organized a crawl up uh, and people always ask me how many steps were there. I don't know, but everybody passed me by as I just sort of did that. Uh, I, I'm embarrassed to say Jennifer Keeland, an eight-year-old, beat me to the top of the Capitol. Uh, but I think that is appropriate because now she's a disability activist and has her own uh, book written about her. So again, new leadership. But the next day, 200 of that people uh, entered the rotunda, the U.S. Capitol rotunda. You can't do that today. And basically uh, working with uh, Patricia Wright, uh, who is called the general, her name is not widely known by people, uh, brought down uh, Bob Michaels, who was speaker at the time, and Steny Hoyer. Uh, and ADAPT, which is not mild in their approach, demanded that the ADA pass tomorrow. Again, we knew obviously that that was a demand they could not do, but it really, the chant, access is a civil right, was just thundering through that capital. And, you know, again, when you see people fighting for their rights, when you're next to people fighting for their rights, you really, it's not just classes, it's not just words, you, you find that you're fighting for your actual rights. And as Lex said, now we're fighting for our life in terms of what's going on with our institutionally bias in terms of that. You know, ADA is nothing but words. It really is, it's a tool. And I think of it sort of in the same version of potential energy that's just sitting there waiting for people to make it into what's called kinetic energy. And what that is, is action. You know, again, ADAPT is mostly known for us getting arrested. I've been arrested, I don't know, 40, 50 times. Uh, but, and so that gets the headlines. But people don't realize all the other type of things 
you know, money following the person came out of Texas. We should be proud of that. It became a national program because uh, when George W. Bush was president, uh, the first $1.75 billion was put in their budget. It was enhanced by President Obama. Uh, and now over 100,000 people have gotten out of institutions, nursing homes, and other large institutions because of the fight that people here in Texas did. And you know, when we first started in ADAPT, we were sort of like, oh, we really like your goals, but we don't like your tactics. You know, again, you know, fighting for your rights is never pretty. You know, we make the allusion to the civil rights thing. And now we've seen, especially with the passing of John Lewis, you know, some of the scenes that he fought, that he was clubbed fighting for his rights. Now, very in, rarely have we been clubbed, but being on the street, direct action, working with lobbyists, working with the legal system, working together, we can and did get the ADA passed. So the 30th anniversary should be not so much a celebration as a jumping off place, because many of us, and you know, Lex and I, we're probably older than we uh, would like to admit, are gonna move on and we need new young leaders. They may do it differently, but again, action is better than inaction. And I have a thing over my desk that says, do something even if it's wrong. And people say, oh, what does that mean? Well, that means that you, you know, again, if you want to fight for your rights, you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be passionate. And that's really what we look for when we go around doing trainings uh, to find new organizers. You need some fire in the belly to continue that. Because again, like I said before, a tax on ADA is there and ADA we should celebrate what we've done, but we should not be complacent. So I just want to leave you all with ADA today, ADA tomorrow, ADA forever, because again, it is a landmark civil rights bill, but like any civil rights bill, we must protect it. And the last thing I'm, I said, I was the last thing before, is that November 3rd, we will be voting for congressional and the president. And if people do not get out to vote, if the disability vote doesn't turn out based on not party, it's nonpartisan issue. And protection of the ADA should be paramount for everybody on this, paramount. If everybody on this call is not registered and tomorrow, go out and register. Maybe not even tomorrow, this afternoon, get registered. And again, get five people because then the disability vote will mean something and we'll get policymakers that will support the ADA. And very much back in 1990 when it passed, it was bipartisan. And though people say, well, in today's environment, Again, we here in Texas have learned that you have to work with both parties to get anything done. So again, uh, thank you very much. This has been a fantastic uh, endeavor that the governor's committee working with the other agencies and I just want to commend them for that and free our people. All right, thank you, Bob, lead on. One of those passionate advocates that I'm very proud to introduce next is Ms. Kim Powers. Kim Powers is uh, a board member and the founding charter member of the Deaf Blind Service Center in Austin, Texas. Uh, many years ago, she had her own uh, cable TV show, Kim's World, and she has been one of the most passionate, powerful advocates uh, for deaf blind Texans working to ensure that they have access to support service providers and the services they need to live independently in our community. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Kim Powers. Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, hello, everyone. 
My name is Kim Powers. I am deafblind and whew, I feel very honored to be a part of this uh, presentation. Uh, 30 years of the ADA. I'm very excited to share with all of you uh, my impressions and my memories. As I look back over the last 30 years, uh, I think about my own TV program, which is called Kim's World. It was a TV program for children with disabilities and covered many different hobbies like snow skiing, water skiing, horseback riding, aerobics instruction. We visited the San Antonio Zoo. And even one time, <laughs> I read children's stories in ASL while with children huddled around me as I was dressed from head to toe as Snow White. And Kim's World is in fact still on YouTube. It's still available and on www.kimsworld.com. Uh, so as I think about those memories, <laughs> uh, at that time, I remember going to my very first ADA event in 1990 in San Antonio. I went with my friend and my interpreter as uh, we both went on stage, but then my interpreter made her way back off stage so that she could be at the microphone for the interpretation of my presentation. And I felt, oh, that I'm alone up here on this stage. And where is my support to provide effective communication at this juncture? The American and deaf and Texas deafblind community thanks the ADA for providing interpreters. That is a huge, huge win. However, American and Texas deafblind community members desperately need, desperately need SSPs and CNs. And I'll explain what that means. SSP stands for Support Service Provider. That is an outdated term, but the currently accepted accepted term is CN or co-navigator. Now, SSPs, support service providers, and CNs, co-navigators, they work hard with independently living persons who are deaf blind to perform essential, basic daily activities like grocery shopping, reading mail and bills, going to medical appointments, going to community events like weddings and funerals, and even getting access to the internet through tactile interpreting, <laughs> which is, excuse me, which is another matter altogether. The fact is that the American deaf blind community has been relying on family and friends to fully access these essential life activities. And so this unfortunately feels like a heavy weight and causes feelings of intense personal devaluement. If deafblind individuals were able to utilize SSPs and CNs, this would, would take a weight off of the hearts of our family and friends and improve our relationships, allow us to see each other as whole, full, and equal. The deafblind community wants the ADA to extend its application to SSPs and CNs so as to provide truly genuine, effective communication, effective communication. Thank you all for listening from your hearts for, and congratulations to 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We've got still more to go. And please, please ask for Governor Abbott. This is my request. Uh, that we have this request posted to Governor Abbott. Oh, and thank you. I, I wanted to add one last thing. As all of us being Americans and Texans, we would like to thank all of our neighbors, our world neighbors, our Texas neighbors, those who have volunteered as SSPs and CNs. Bless your hearts. I love you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Kim. Our next speaker is Mr. Tara Gilman, who is a phenomenal leader. Uh, we'd like to consider ourselves to be a good judge of talent and the disability community is gonna need strong leadership moving forward. Tar is the secretary of the Austin Association of the Deaf, uh, and he was the first black deaf video blogger in YouTube beginning back in 2006, and is a longtime member of uh, Deaf Video TV, a channel on YouTube. Uh, 
He was uh, born deaf and grew up in Michigan, but got to Texas just as quickly as he could. Uh, he is an American Sign Language activist and a participant in se uh, several rallies, including the Unity Rally for Gallaudet in 2006, and where I first had the pleasure of meeting him at the Deaf Grassroots Movement in 2016 at uh, the Texas State Capitol. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Tar Gilman. One moment, Ron, I don't see Tar's video on, one second. Okay. There we go. Hello, hello everyone. Hang on one second. Okay, I had something pop up. Well, hello everybody. I hope everyone can see me clearly now. Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanna make sure, thank you everybody for participating in the 30 years of the ADA. Now, I would like you to look at what we've done over the course of these 30 years. You know, you've heard different stories and different presentations from different presenters, such as Kim Powers and the such. But I think it's important that we look at these stories and they really help us see how we can maybe improve our community. I would like to share my personal story. I go to different stores, different venues, banks, shopping, and so forth. Oftentimes, deaf people, we struggle with communication access. We're having to write back and forth. We're trying to try to lip read. And this in turn causes numerous misunderstandings repeatedly. And so ongoing with this situation on a daily basis is really become tiring. So maybe we need to have a new approach. So we started using American Sign Language in stores, in the grocery store, when we go to the bank, everywhere we go, we sign. And we think it's important that we can sign and we encourage hearing people to learn American Sign Language and how to communicate that fits our needs. You know, a little bit of a funny story, you'll see a lot of interpreters and really those interpreters are designed for you, the hearing people. We as deaf people do not need interpreters. And the reason why is because we will never be able to learn to hear. However, hearing people can learn American Sign Language. So the interpreters are there for you to help you understand what we're talking about and build that bridge between the two of us. I just wanna talk about some brief history within the deaf community. In September of 1880, in Italy, there was a town called Milan. And they had their second conference, and it was called the International Congress on the Education for the Deaf. It's the ICED. And we also had Alexander Graham Bell. A.G. Bell got together and they came to an agreement and voted on a decision on what would be the best educational system for the deaf people. And they decided to prohibit sign language and force deaf people to learn to lip read. Now that historical moment was one of the most darkest moments within the deaf community's history. And that led all the way till today, from the 1800s to today. Now, this recommendation forced deaf children to learn oralism all through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And if you wanted to learn sign language, they would use a ruler or another type of mechanical device that would slap you in the hand and they would forbid you to learn sign language. You must learn oralism. You have to learn to speak. So they forced these children. And these children grew up with a lot of tra trauma, a lot of suffering. So the deaf community went through a lot in our history. We had to deal with a lot of frustrations and we had to fight a lot of battles. Then in the 1970s, American Sign Language was recognized. And that gave an opportunity for people to learn sign language. And within sign language, everybody could see each other and we could learn together. Then we go to 1988 
We had Deaf President Now at Gallaudet University. We all marched and we wanted to change our administration. We wanted a Deaf President at the university. We protested and it was successful. The board got together and they elected a Deaf President. That movement showed the world how we could collaborate and work together. And that was the last time that we saw everybody actually on all different sides working together. Now, fast forward to the deaf grassroots movement, DGM. There was a lot of protests and a lot of divide. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to do more. We wanted to add more teeth to the ADA. The ADA was focused on specifics and we wanted it to be more generalized. We wanted it to include blacks. We wanted to include indigenous people. We wanted to include people of color, LGBTQIA community, the deaf blind community. There were so many other marginalized populations that needed support and that needed their rights protected. It wasn't enough. There were so many different levels of systemic oppression within our community and so many things that we had to fight for. And we were still fighting. Even to this day, we we're fighting. There are a lot of deaf schools that are struggling with an appropriate education system. And now with the COVID pandemic and those issues that it presents, we had to stop and we had to reevaluate ourselves. This actually gave us an opportunity to really think about what we were seeing and how Black Lives Matter, what the, how that was impacting our community. And we looked within our own community and said, okay, can the ADA work with everybody? Now, my closing thoughts. I want everybody to look at what the ADA has done for us over the course of these 30 years, what it means to all those communities. Have we done enough? I think that's something that we need to really evaluate and think about. And we need to make a better position and maybe a better society for our children, for all different groups of people. I think we have a duty it is our responsibility. Don't wait and give it to the next generation. Don't do that. We have to fix it now. That's all I want to say. Thank you. And I'll see you later. Thank you, Tar. Up next, we're going to hear from Renee Lopez. Uh, Renee is a disability sorry, rights. Moment, Ron, I've got okay. to see which interpreter is on. Okay. Thank you. I just needed to make sure we had the spotlight on her. Thank you, Randy. So up next, we're going to hear from Renee Lopez. Uh, Renee is a disability rights advocate and an advisory board member for Safe Disability Services. Uh, she is a 56-year-old woman with a physical disability who was born and raised in Austin, Texas, and has lived here her entire life. Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Texas, Hookham Horns, and has worked for the state of Texas for over 30 years and is now retired. Uh, and that hasn't kept her from being very busy. As a, uh, when she was a student at the University of Texas, she got her start as a disability advocate uh, fighting for uh, accessibility on campus and the rights of students with disabilities. Uh, she is on the advisory board for uh, Safe Disability Services uh, since 2010 as a uh, presenter and uh, teaching on issues of violence and uh, abuse against persons with disabilities and is also a member of a core uh, core group of coalition put together by VERA, V-E-R-A, Institute of Justice on Ending Violence Against People with Disabilities. Please join me in welcoming Renee Lopez. Hi, thank you, Ron. Um, I wanted to show these pictures that you'll be seeing as I speak because um, I want to start from kind of the beginning. Um, this picture that you see here was taken when I was at Gonzalez Warm Springs Rehabilitation Hospital. And even though I was going through physical therapy, one of the things I learned uh, without actually being told, but yet I knew that um, I didn't really have any rights. Um, it was, I grew up during the 60s when the racial civil rights was taking place 
but this did not include people with disabilities. And uh, so even though it was during my formative years, I still didn't think I belonged. And growing up, I was told by so many people that, you know, I would never work, I would never get married, I would never own a house, I would never do this, I would never do that, I wouldn't do anything. The, whole, the only thing I would ever do is just be taken care of by my family. Hopefully won't have to go into a nursing home until I die. Well, fast forward to 1981 when I went to the University of Texas and I met a group of people, uh, students there that uh, were, were together. And, you know, at the time, ADAPT was going through uh, the transportation, uh, we will ride. And uh, we decided to do something similar at UT. And we formed a group called People Against Barriers, where we tried to get the uh, transit system at the university, the UT buses, to become accessible or at least fix it so that we don't have to pay um, for something we couldn't use. And I remember thinking at the time, um, I was scared. I, I kept thinking, oh my God, they're going to kick us out of school and I need this degree. And, you know, uh, I didn't want to rock the boat because I was I was really scared. I had never done anything like this before. But then I saw the what ADAPT was doing. I saw what was taking place. I saw the Capitol crawl. And I remember when I saw that um, the first time I was just completely turned around. It, it, it empowered me like nothing else ever had. And I understood why they were doing what they were doing because they were getting tired of the passiveness of the legislature to pass this law. And I totally understood that because I was tired and I didn't do half as much as what these people were doing. So things changed for me. I, I became empowered and wanted to, wanted to become a, a, an advocate, but I was still hesitant. I was very shy and I was afraid to speak up, but eventually uh, time changes that <laughs> when you start to realize that if you don't speak up, you will get forgotten. You really will. And um, so I graduated from the university uh, feeling more empowered and I got my bachelor's degree and then I went on and got my master's degree and I thought to myself, surely I'm gonna get a job. Surely, why not? I mean, obviously I have shown that I have capabilities and that I have intelligence and who wouldn't wanna hire me? Well, boy, was I wrong. I could not get a job for anything. I went months and months going to interviews and getting absolutely nothing. And just to give you an example, I went to a job interview with the Texas Employment Commission, ironically, who um, when the sort of interview, before it even ended, after he asked a couple of questions, he turned to me and said, Ms. Lopez, why are you here? Why don't you leave this job to people who can work? Just go home to your mommy and daddy, get your government check and let people take care of you. And when he said that I was appalled and I felt like punching him in the face or, or reporting him to somebody, but to who? I had no recourse. Well, a couple of, this was in 87 and in 1990, um, the ADA was signed. And I think the uh, employment section one, I think has certainly been something that it helped, has helped most of us with employment. And I keep thinking that if that man were to say something like that to me today, he could not get away with it at all. Or if nothing else, I would have recourse. And I hope that no one ever has to go through that again. So as Bob said, um, we still have a lot to do. I think there's still a lot of systemic issues uh, within our government. I'm talking about SSI, Medicaid, uh, nursing homes, things like that. We still have to overcome attendants still need to have higher wages. And uh, so there's a lot of work. And uh, I'm glad that ADA is, this 30th is called moving forward because that's exactly what we have to do. So 
The ADA, the way I see it, is a foundation. It gives us a place to build the house that we need to finish building. And it's gonna take all of us. It's gonna take the same unified group of people that we had before. It's gonna take more young people because those of us who were started out back in the 70s and 80s are gonna get old. <laughs> I'm already old, I'm actually 59, even though I think the Rob Brown said 56. But anyway, it's something very, very important. It's something we absolutely have to keep working on. And I know I'll keep working on it for as long as I possibly can. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Renee. So if the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act was led by Texans, we can say that the 30th anniversary celebration was led by University of Texas graduates. And hopefully people won't think this is a conspiracy of Longhorns, but I want to introduce uh, another Longhorn in our list of speakers this morning, Ms. Alejandrina Guzman is a uh, disabled activist from Azel, Texas. In 2017, she was elected the very first uh, Latina student uh, body president at the University of Texas at Austin and the first president with a physical disability in the Big 12 Conference uh, in uh, the US. In the 86th uh, Texas legislative session, uh, she served as a Mexican American uh, legislative caucus fellow and she is currently uh, serving uh, here in Austin uh, working as a Peoples with Disabilities uh, constituency organizer, empowering and mobilizing uh, disabled people uh, across Texas. Please join me in welcoming Alejandrina Guzman. Hi everyone, I'm Alejandrina Guzman. I am a Latina woman with long black hair, wearing glasses, hoop earrings, and a purple blouse. 2013, one breezy night, I'm all dressed up, having a social night out with friends. Non-stop laughter. We get to the venue and we realize that the main event is on the third floor. No problem. We planned ahead and we know there's an elevator. We get to the back area and the elevator doesn't work. What do you mean? We called three times leading up to tonight to make sure the elevator would be working. My friends ended up lifting my 300 pound power wheelchair. Yes, up three flights of stairs. And yes, three flights of stairs to get back down. 2017. A long day after classes and meetings, I'm frantically working on a midterm essay. My friend and I realize it's super late, so we pack up our stuff and head home. We arrive at my apartment complex, press the elevator button and wait. A few seconds later, we realize that the button wasn't turning on. Press again, nothing. Three times later, we decide the elevator doesn't work. It's totally okay. This apartment building has two elevators. It doesn't work either. We made calls to the front service desk, then went in person to officially report it. Nothing can really be done until about 24 hours later. Check in the morning. The morning, it is the morning. It is three o'clock in the morning. As a student leader on campus, I was lucky I had access to a student office. I stayed overnight in that space. I wasn't able to get to my apartment until 7 p.m. the next day, 2019. It's the first day we moved to a new building for work. I look around as I'm getting to the elevator. I see the sign. Handicap accessible bathroom on the first floor. Oh, okay. The ADA accessible bathrooms are on this floor. Got it. Mm. Let me inspect it super fast. The stalls are tiny, every single one of them. I'm shocked, perplexed, the 
disappointed. You know what? I'll survey the other floors too. Nope. All the bathrooms in the building are identical. Not a single one of them ADA accessible. Wow. I couldn't believe it at this point in time. At this point in time. I am just one disabled person with the mic right now, sharing short snippets of my life as a physically disabled woman. Our experiences as disabled people vary. To those of us with physical disabilities, to neurodiversity, deaf, blind, invisible disabilities, chronic illness, psychiatric disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and all and those of us with multiple disabilities and all disabilities in between. At the same time, our stories bring us all together. My experience with the ADA hasn't entirely been from a legislation aspect. It has also been a foundational understanding of how it is all interconnected with self-empowered disabled people. I celebrate the ADA because I have a monumental civil rights act dedicated for my disabled self, fought vigorously by all the passionate disabled activists. I celebrate the ADA because even with the policy shortfalls, the very existence of the ADA demonstrates the tenacity and fearlessness of my disabled siblings across the country that will stop at nothing to keep fighting for justice. It's frustration and appreciation. It's anger and happiness. It's exhaustion and resilience. Disabled people have always had power all of us in our community joined together by interdependence. ADA 30 reminds me that movements work, dreaming and imagination works, that people power continues to exist and that we are on our way towards a more equitable, universally inclusive and justice oriented world for all our disabled siblings in solidarity and free our people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guzman, for sharing that story. Up next, we're going to hear from Gabe Casares. Gabe is the director of the Houston Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities and is part of Mayor Turner's executive team. He oversees the delivery of timely and accessible services for more than a fifth million Houstonians with disabilities. Prior to his appointment with the mayor's office, Gabe served as the manager of the uh, National Federation of the Blinds Government Affairs Office. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Gabe Casares. Thank you, Ron. I am honored to have this opportunity to share with you some brief remarks and reflections on the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But I can't go on without acknowledging our CRIP ancestors, the disabled people that came before my generation, Generation ADA, and that laid the groundwork for this celebration today. People we have already heard from like Bob Kafka, Dr. Lex Frieden, other disability warriors like Maria Palacios and many others. Uh, in Houston, I have been fortunate to grow under the mentorship of folks like Norma and Glenn Crosby and many other blind people that have taught me that it is respectable to be blind. The Americans with Disabilities Act turn, turns 30 on July 26. And although we have come a long way, we have a long way to go. My generation, Generation ADA, has benefited greatly from the passage of the ADA. In fact, the ADA precedes me by a year and a half. I came onto the scene on May 17th, 1992. So the only world that I have known is a world that has been uh, described and written by the Americans with Disabilities Act. But like many other folks, 
the COVID-19 pandemic has laid to bear the shortcomings and the areas where my generation needs to pick up the torch and carry us forward. There are still too many websites with critical information that are inaccessible to screen reader users that don't have the option to enlarge font or text. There are still too many video conferences that are happening without captions or ASL interpretation. There are still too many documents that are shared with critical information that are not tagged for screen access technology or that are not interoperable with refreshable braille display. The 30th anniversary of the ADA is a moment for us to celebrate and recognize how far we have come, but it also grants us an opportunity to think about where we are and where we need to go. It also provides us an opportunity to recommit ourselves to disability rights cross-disability action, a movement that will make the future truly accessible. Only then will we be able to achieve the full, the full opportunity and promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So while we pause and recognize and reflect on our achievements, our collective power, the strength of our voice, Let's also remember that our disability community is diverse and that none of us are free until all of us are free. Let's recommit ourselves to build a more accessible future for those who come behind us. Let's recommit ourselves to make the next 30 years of the ADA the most accessible in our history. Lead on. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Gabe. Up next, we're going to hear from another member of the ADA generation and a Longhorn, uh, Mr. Archer Hadley. Archer is a senior from the University of Texas at Austin, majoring in political science and an appointee to the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, one of our own. He founded Archer's Challenge, a nonprofit which uh, challenges people uh, to navigate the world from a wheelchair. He, his mission is to enhance the understanding of mobility challenges uh, and to drive change in the world to make our environment more universally accessible. Let's go ahead and hear from Archer who has provided a video. Hello everyone. My name is Archer Hadley and I'm a senior at the University of Texas at Austin studying political science. And I'm honored to be here with you today as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the signing of the ADA. This is a tremendous occasion as we celebrate the sacrifice and impact that those leaders before us made so that people with disabilities in the modern era can experience independence and freedom that everyone else experienced. I want to start out today by telling you that you should be proud. You should be proud that you're a part of this movement. You should be proud that you're attending this event. And you should be proud that you're making an effort to leave an impact for not just people with disabilities, but for all Americans, no matter whether they face a challenge or not. Because independence achieved for those with disabilities is independence achieved for all people. That is something that is gravely missed by many people. And I wanna encourage you that you can become involved in your communities, in your groups, and leave a tremendous impact on, on this world, not just for people with disabilities, but for everyone. For example, I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Archer's Challenge. We strive to create independence for those with mobility disabilities by allowing able-bodied people to spend the day in a wheelchair to experience navigating the world in a wheelchair like somebody with a mobility challenge would have to do. Over the past five years of our program, we have raised over a million dollars for those with mobility impairments and made structural improvements and installed automatic doors all across the state of Texas. And we 
we are honored to leave this impact on our state and on our communities. And this is an example of something that I have done to leave my mark on the world, not just for those with disabilities, but for everyone. And I encourage you to do the same thing as you go throughout this event, think about the mark that you can leave on your community. No matter how small, it will make a difference. We're developing an army to lead the charge for this cause so that we can continue the movement that such great leaders left before us. Thank you so much for listening and I'm honored to be here with you today. Have a great day. All right, it's a privilege to have uh, young Texans like Archer Hadley, who are members of the ADA generation to lead on. Uh, we, we need uh, to train behind and bring up the next generation of disability advocates. Uh, before we look forward, we're gonna look back one last time. Uh, before the coronavirus, each day when I came into my office, uh, hanging up behind my coat rack is a picture of the signing ceremony of the Americans with Disabilities Act. My staff know that I often say anytime something important happens in this country, there's at least a couple of Texans involved. In that picture, we see uh, President George H.W. Bush from Texas. And of course, we see a picture of a man in a Stetson cowboy hat, and that individual is Justin Dart. Most of us regard Justin Dart as the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. For our next speaker, uh, she considers Justin Dart to just be dad. It's an indeed a, been a pleasure for me to get to know Ann Washington. Uh, it, it's clear to me that the uh, Dart family is a family with tremendous love. And Ann Washington is going to share her father's uh, final words, which are not only a benediction, but a call to action. Just want to share a little bit more uh, with you about the amazing woman, Ann Washington. Ann uh, is the daughter of Justin Dart. She has uh, ongoing interest in support of disability civil rights, uh, but also is heavily invested in women's and children's advocacy issues. Uh, she's worked in healthcare uh, for many years. Her life's motto is selfless, soulful journey lead with love, which really embodies the spirit of Justin Dart. Uh, please join me in uh, listening to Ann Washington by video as she shares her father's final words. This celebration for the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years ago. Reflecting back as a child, I saw my father, Justin Dart, as a giant among men. And today, nothing has changed. He remains that giant in my mind. My dad, Justin, had the unique ability to see the value and potential in every human being. He was a powerful support and cheerleader in my life and in the lives of so many. He lived with humility, determination, and love for all. His thirst for justice and inclusion was never quenched. His final message to us all was, Dearly beloved, listen to the heart of this old soldier. As with all of us, the time comes when body and mind are battered and weary. But I do not go quietly into the night. I do not give up struggling to be a responsible contributor to the sacred continuum of human life. I do not give up struggling to overcome my weakness, to conform my life and that part of my life called death to the great values of the human dream. Death is not a tragedy. It is not an evil from which we must escape. Death is as natural as birth. Like childbirth, death is often a time of fear and pain, but of also profound beauty, of celebration of the mystery and majesty, which is life pushing its horizons towards oneness with the truth of Mother Universe. The days of dying carry a special responsibility. 
there is a great potential to communicate values in a uniquely powerful way. The person who dies demonstrating for civil rights. Let my final actions be a thunder of love, solidarity, and a protest of empowerment. I adamantly protest the richest culture in the history of the world, a culture which has the obvious potential to create a golden age of science and democracy dedicated to maximizing the quality of life of every person, but which still squanders the majority of its human and physical capital on modern versions of primitive symbols of power and prestige. I adamantly protest the richest culture in the history of the world, which still incarcerates millions of humans with and without disabilities in barbaric institutions, backrooms, and worse, windowless cells of oppressive perceptions for the lack of the most elementary empowerment supports. I call for solidarity among all who love justice, all who love life, to create a revolution that will empower every single human being to govern his or her life, to govern the society and to be fully productive of life quality for self and for all. I do so love all the patriots of this and every nation who have fought and sacrificed to bring us to the threshold of this beautiful human dream. I do so love America, the beautiful, and our wild, creative, beautiful people. I do so love you, my beautiful colleagues in the disability and civil rights movement. My relationship with Yoshko Dart includes, but also transcends love as the word is normally defined. She is my wife, my partner, my mentor, my leader, and my inspiration to believe that the human dream can live. She is the greatest human being I have ever known. Yoshko, beloved colleagues, I am the luckiest man in the world to have been associated with you. Thanks to you, I die free. Thanks to you, I die in the joy of struggle. Thanks to you, I die in the beautiful belief that the revolution of empowerment will go on. I love you so much. I'm with you always. Lead on, lead on. Inspiring words that echo to this day uh, to call on all of us to lead on. That concludes our list of inspiring speakers and brings us to the second half of our program. And remarkably, we're only 15 minutes behind. Uh, what we're gonna hear from next is what I recall our ADA tour of Texas. I always tell my staff that the biggest part of Texas is the part outside of Austin. And as we hear about how the Americans with Disabilities Act have impact of these communities. We're going to start with the city of Abilene, Mayor Anthony Williams. Welcome to the city of Abilene, the sort of the capital of America. We're here at downtown's Everman Park, where we have six sculptures of our students' characters and this beautiful one based on a story by William Joyce. It's entitled, Childhood's Greatest Adventure. It's a holiday classic. It's a story based on a brother and a sister who traveled from Abilene all the way to the North Pole. When you travel to Abilene, you'll find so much more to add to your story and see how we're working to make sure it's a place where everyone can enjoy. Aside from the two dozen storybook sculptures to enjoy throughout downtown Abilene. The National Center for Children's Illustrated Literature helps children in Abilene and even around the country know the joy of reading at absolutely no cost. 
to experience the history of our region at Frontier, Texas, where you can relive stories of the Old West and meet some of the greatest characters through unique holographic technology. Frontier, Texas is also the official visitor center for the Texas Forest Trail region. Beyond downtown, and its Boston Brewery, entertainment, retail, and restaurant scene, we'd love to live the cowboy life and one of a dozen events at the Taylor County Expo Center. Take a walk on the wild side, Abilene Zoo. And of course, top it off with fun with your choice in the best Texas dining, uh, one of our fabulous restaurants. As mayor of Abilene, I've made it my focus to bring everyone to the table so that all of our voices and perspectives can be heard. The work has included everything from diversifying our boards and commissions to create a citizen advisory board for people with disabilities. Then the last year, the city has rolled out a new fully ADA compliant website to help all of our residents utilize city resources. Closed captions, our broadcast city meetings, and soon ASL interpretation at city council meetings and news conferences. Just this month, we celebrated the reopening of downtown historic Mentor Park. It's home of a number of our short of sculptures and also home of the largest outdoor water curtain in the nation. But more importantly, all of our friends and neighbors can have full access to the park renovated to meet ADA accessibility standards. As we celebrate 30 years of progress through the Americans with Disabilities Act, Abilene is ready to write the next chapter in a story that includes a happy ending for every Texan. All right. It's important to note uh, when uh, the mayor of Abilene was elected, the first campaign promise he kept was to establish the Abilene Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities and make sure that uh, citizens with disabilities had a seat at that table. Up next, we're going to hear from the city of Arlington and an old friend of ours, uh, Ms. Donna Mack, who's the chair of the Arlington Mayor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Welcome, Donna. Thank you, Ron. Arlington's known for its incredible, incredible accessible professional sports venues. And why is that? It's all due to investment in community. It started back right after the passage of the ADA with the construction of Globe Life Field, the first MLB stadium to be built after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And before the, before the project was complete, reps from the Texas Rangers organization contacted our committee to ask for our input on their accessibility features. And we jumped at the chance because back at that time, nobody asked us what we thought. The Rangers absolutely impressed us yeah. with the fact that they went so far above and beyond the requirements of the ADA. We made a few suggestions for tweaks and they listened to us. They implemented those changes and it forged an amazing friendship that's firm to this day. We invested in our community. We had a similar experience um, as part of the accessibility committee for AT&T Stadium with the Dallas Cowboys. And one of our committee's crowning glories to this day is to have had the privilege along with the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities to host the very first luncheon in that venue, the 26th annual Barbara Jordan Media Awards. Thanks for investing in us, GC. <laughs> so that brings us back around to the Rangers again We've been able to invest in them. They've invested in us again in the construction of Globe Life Field, our beautiful brand new baseball stadium. And we are all looking forward with eager anticipation to the time when we'll all be able to safely gather together in groups because <laughs> we've got an amazing inclusive celebration planned for that day in that venue. We couldn't invest in our committee in our community without first being invested in by amazing community leaders like our mayor, the Honorable Jeff Williams. And for those who don't know, Mayor Williams by profession is an engineer. So he's got a keen eye 
for accessibility in the built environment, but he's also a man of great integrity. And he really has a heart for inclusion. He's done an incredible job of raising the visibility of our committee as a resource, not only within the departments of the city itself, but in the community at large. And we're so grateful for that level of investment in our community. But just like some of our prior speakers have said, we have so far to go with respect to equal access to, oh my gosh, healthcare, transportation, effective communications, internet access. And the only way we can do that is by continuing to invest in the disability community and in community with our able-bodied allies. Happy 30th ADA. Looking so forward to all the next 30 has to offer. Thank you. Ron, we can't hear you. I've been muted, okay. One of the governor's committee's key functions is to work with a network of local committees across the state. And one of the committees I've had the longest association with has been the Austin Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. I'd like to introduce their current chair, uh, Mr. Jonathan Franks, who will then share words from Austin's mayor. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Ron. My name is Jonathan Franks. I'm the chairman of the Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities in Austin. And I am proud to say I work alongside a committee of advocates that tirelessly endeavor to eliminate access barriers for people with disabilities living in Austin. I currently hold a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Texas at Austin, as well as a master's degree in social work from Texas State University. And I strongly believe that without the ADA, I would not have been able to achieve this goal. As many have said before, we have a long way to go, but we have also made many strides in the city of Austin. And it is my distinct honor to, um, to open up for Mayor Steve Adler of the city of Austin to talk about those achievements. Thank you, Ron. Hi, this is Steve Adler, and it's great to be part of this 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act in July. Uh, it has been something that has opened up opportunity, uh, uh, access, uh, equity uh, for, for a significant part of our community, and it's something that really deserves celebration. Uh, I am here to, to acknowledge the, the millions of people uh, with disabilities across the nation that have benefited uh, from this, the, the, the first ever Civil Rights Act uh, for people uh, with disabilities. I am proud that the city of Austin has always valued our residents and visitors with disabilities and wanting to, 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 to make them part of everything that is happening in our city. Uh, we continue to, 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 to lead the fight as best we can against inaccessibility to our city programs, our services, uh, and our facilities. We've led with action uh, and intent to, to facilitate full inclusion um, with respect to learning and working and playing in our city. In fact, you see it when you arrive in our city. Uh, Austin Bergstrom International Airport has free audible wayfinding services for, for our blind and visually impaired travelers, indoor relief area uh, for travelers with service animals. We recently opened a fully accessible new central library, not only fully accessible, uh, but named one of the top five libraries in the world and, and Time Magazine said one of the top seven places, coolest places anywhere. Uh, in Austin, it is possible to text 911 at uh, CTECC, uh, which is our 911 uh, communications uh, center. Uh, you can find accessible playscapes throughout our city parks and, and an accessible mobile library. 
Our Parks and Recreation Department staffs have an inclusion unit uh, that is committed to making sports and recreational activities available to adults and children uh, with disabilities. Our Public Works Department ensures safe pedestrian travel through the installation of hundreds of crossing signals that audibly tell pedestrians when it is safe to cross our busy intersections. Austin is home to fully accessible bus and rail system, and efforts are constantly being made to, to improve our pedestrian rights of way. Um, we want to provide the highest level of access to our residents and our visitors that use wheelchairs or white canes or other mobility devices. Uh, we operate a fully accessible convention center and ably host conferences and conventions, uh, including people uh, of all types of disabilities. Our city is a learning hub for people with disabilities. It's home to the Texas School for the Blind and the Visually Impaired, the Texas School for the Deaf and the, and the Chris Cole Rehabilitation Center for the Blind. You know, because of these resources, we are proud to provide high levels of access to uh, employment for job seekers with disabilities. We recognize that while we have done a lot, there is still an awful lot still to do. Uh, as mayor of Austin, I remain committed uh, to this journey toward universal access uh, to persons with disabilities. This is a wonderful day to celebrate. We love being part of the celebration. Happy 30th birthday, uh, ADA. Uh, you come, you've come a long way. We're going to be part of going the long way still to come. Take care. All right. We appreciate those remarks from the city of Austin. Up next, we're going to hear from Corpus Christi, a city that embodies the slogan, nothing about us without us. We've had a, a change up in speakers. Uh, Mr. Billy Delgado is now leading our state's emergency uh, preparedness response uh, for some upcoming storms this weekend. Stepping in for Billy Delgado is Ms. Crystal Lyons, who's a consultant and longtime friend to people with disabilities, not only in Corpus Christi, but across the state. Please join me in welcoming Crystal Lyons. Good morning from the Coastal Band and happy ADA anniversary. I'm here to share a powerful example of what a community can do together. Locally, we have a long established functional needs support team that is dedicated to whole community planning, assist by providing input on evacuation and communication through drills and tabletop exercises, provides training for first responders throughout the region, and just recently to over 80 evacuation hub volunteers. We're, we're especially busy this year as we've been asked to provide input related to COVID, social distancing and other considerations during hurricane planning. Everyone's input is needed. Here, everyone's input is valued. We're at the table and we know we make a difference and we're empowered to make a difference. The cross disability team of the, uh, consists of the city of Corpus Christi Office of Emergency Management, the, the Corpus Christi ADA coordinator, who is the liaison to both the city's committee for persons with disabilities and the functional needs support team. And representatives, both disability professionals and experts from the following organizations. The Coastal Bend Center for Independent Living, 211 Texas United Way Helpline, Noasis Center for Mental Health and Intellectual Disabilities, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Center, Lighthouse for the Blind, Texas A&M Corpus Christi Disability Services, Area Agency on Aging and the Aging and Disability Resource Center, at Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, along with an individual who is blind with a background in public transportation, and individuals who experience in community hospice care, children's medical services, and disability consulting. We're very proud to have been dedicated to working together for 15 years. And like Ron said, nothing about us without us. We don't have to fight to be at the table. We're there and we're very um, excited to encourage you and your community to create a, a local or regional team to provide cross disability education for first responders and inclusive disaster planning preparedness for the whole community. So stay safe if you live along the coast. Uh, stay dry, and thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal. 
Oh, it's just a coincidence that we have uh, that we're going to hear from two crystals in a row. Our, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Crystal Baker with AT&T. Uh, so heading back up uh, north to Dallas. When I think of Dallas, I think of a dynamic city that is the uh, host, the headquarters of many of our state's biggest employers. And Dallas has decided to put its best foot forward by serving as an example of employment best practices and asking one of their biggest employers, AT&T, to share remarks on their city's implementation of the ADA. Please uh, join me in hearing from Crystal Baker with AT&T representing the city of Dallas. Crystal, can you unmute your mic? I believe Crystal has a video. Then I have an error because I don't have a video in okay. this slide. So I We're apologize. Go we are going to circle back and we will do, uh, we will end with Dallas and that will give us time to get that queued up. All right. Next up, we're going to hear from the city of Denison and Mayor Janet Gott, who also has a video of her community's uh, celebration greetings for the 30th anniversary of the ADA. Here we go. Hello, I'm Janet Goddard. and I'm the mayor of Denison, Texas. And in our community, we focus on quality of life for all of our citizens, regardless of their circumstances. Our ADA journey began many years ago, but it is changing because we're finding better ways to serve those with disabilities. Our historic Main Street has been accessible for many years with crosswalks and ramps, but we have found that even those are limiting. So at the end of this year, we will begin construction on a $45 million streetscape that will create a curbless environment where all eight blocks of our historic downtown will be 100% ADA accessible. Parks, trails and green spaces are important to all of our citizens. And our community is currently developing a master trail plan, which will include the first phase of our Katy Trail, which is currently under construction. I would like to give a shout out to Textile for their generous grant to fund the first phase of our trail and to the Sherman Denison MPO for all of their support. Our KD Trail, when it is complete, will connect every major node throughout our community and will be accessible to all. As we enhance and improve the parts in our system, we are focusing on making sure that they're inclusive. The trails around our beautiful Waterloo Lake are currently under construction and will be completed in early 2021. Those trails will belong to everyone because they will be totally accessible. We have to remain cognizant of the most vulnerable among us, our children with special needs. You know, what is easy for some is very, very difficult for others. So we are so proud that we will dedicate in early August inclusive playground equipment that is designed to bring joys and endless smiles to the faces of our special kids. Our ADA journey continues as we focus on improving and enhancing the lives of all of our citizens. You know, quality of life is just how we roll in Denison, Texas. So congratulations, ADA for 30 spectacular years. Thank you, Mayor Gott. 
So we're going to go back up to North Texas and hear from the city of Denton. It's worth noting that uh, the newest mayor's committee for people with disabilities uh, here in Texas uh, is the city of Denton's mayor's committee. And uh, representing the city of Denton, we're going to hear from Beth Haswell uh, Kirkby. Ms. Kirkby. And Ms. Kirkby, we're going to have to unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Howdy, all y'all. My name is Beth Haswell Kirkby, and I serve as the vice chair on the City of Denton Committee on Persons with Disabilities. Denton is a university town, and universities tend to be on the forefront of change. As the University of North Texas and Texas Women's University became more ADA accessible 30 years ago, they began to attract more disabled students who needed Denton to accommodate them. Denton stepped up and began ADA compliance. A large community-based disability group met informally for many years, but they couldn't make formal recommendations to the city. So the Denton City Council formalized the Committee on Persons with Disabilities as a permanent way to have input from and for disabled citizens. In a year and a half, we've made good progress, especially in training city employees. We recommended formal ADA training be offered and nearly every department sent a representative and they asked good questions. Our frequent requests to clarify if a disabled person could use Zoom to be a part of a committee gave Denton a head start moving to remote city council meetings and other committee meetings during the lockdown. We've given input on a new pedestrian crosswalk pattern for our main square. The all walk crosswalk causes traffic to stop in all four directions if a pedestrian needs to cross. This means all four crosswalks are available for, for pedestrians at one time. The results have been very positive, increasing visibility, pedestrian safety, and decreasing jaywalk. Diagonal crosswalks are in our future plans, as well as adding interval pedestrian delays on crosswalks citywide. When our committee began, Denton had three different ADA coordinators who handled any ADA issues related to their department on a part-time basis. As of this month, the city is looking to fill a position with someone with ADA training and background and ADA issues will be 50% of their job description. That's huge progress for us. We've added language to allow city restoration grants to be used for ADA compliance upgrades, which is important in our historic district. We've changed language on many city forms to make it more inclusive. A large playground that was funded and built by citizens had to be removed. When asked, residents wanted an inclusive playground and that was added. We're also adding more universal design in our 2030 plans. My personal proudest moment was getting designated handicapped parking at the Denton Arts and Jazz Festival, our largest annual event. When asked, the organizers said they simply hadn't thought of it before. The ADA may be 30 years old, but we need to keep speaking out for what we need as disabled citizens, because we can't expect able folks to always think like us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kirkby. Now we're gonna head down south uh, to Texas, to the Rio Grande Valley, uh, to the city of Edinburgh, where we're gonna hear from an old friend of the governor's committee on people with disabilities, Dr. Sean Saladin, who works with the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm setting my timer for my 180 seconds of fame here. I just want to start off with, um, like you said, I'm Sean Saladin. I'm the Associate Vice President for uh, Faculty within the Division of Health Affairs. I was mainstream back in 75, started my career with uh, rehabilitation counseling happened to be July of 1990, just right as the ADA was passing, so been in the thick of it. 
Uh, fast forward, I've been working with governor's committees, the gubernatorial appointments for the last 15 years. So I've been working for free for 15 years for the good people of the great state of Texas, 30 years with the ADA under my belt. Well, I just wanna say in my little bit of time left, Edinburgh is growing. We've come a long way with our um, accessibility issues. It was, it, we were pretty far behind back when I got here in 2005, but we're doing a lot better. We have, um, uh, we've expanded sports arenas, entertainment venues, all accessible. In the, uh, we still have our Valley Association of Independent Living down here. They're very involved in the community. Uh, from what you see on the screen there, University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, we have uh, uh, started the School of Medicine. We just um, graduated the first class last year, so it's still relatively new. And um, we're, that's had really opened up the visibility of disability issues. The executive vice president and dean of the School of Medicine happens to be, happens to have a master's in rehabilitation counseling. So he's very aware. We have about 21 clinics across the valley. And we have, I have, I'm a co-director of three of the area health education centers, which, are, which is off of the HRSA grant, which are basically clinics down in um, the Colonias. So there's a lot more uh, accessibility for people for medical and other types of services in the extremely rural, underserved, impoverished areas, if you will. We are focusing on transportation, as does everybody. And we actually got all the partners together to set up another bus stop at one of our uh, AHEC sites, the one in uh, Colonia is known as San Carlos. I was, you know, we've been dealing with this for 30 years, dealing with transportation issues that I've known of for 30 years, but to finally get everybody together in one place, all the, the state, the county, the precinct, the judges, everybody together to actually build one of these things and maintain it, that's, a, that is a, that's an accomplishment. In my last 12 seconds, we do have a long way to go, as you've mentioned in all the other communities, but without the ADA, I would not be where I am now as an associate vice president. Thank you. Dr. Selden, thank you for your leadership and for helping to bring the people of the Rio Grande Valley together to solve problems like transportation. All right, we're gonna head far out to West Texas to hear from uh, the city of El Paso. In 2019, the governor's committee was proud to hold one of our meetings and our Lex Frieden Employment Awards uh, with the city of El Paso and their workforce board. We're gonna hear from Josue Rodriguez, who's an organizer with Desert Adapt. Mr. Rodriguez. Hi, good morning, and thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Josue Rodriguez. I'm a Hispanic male with black hair, brown eyes, and tan skin. I'm wearing glasses and a black t-shirt. I will be delivering a report on behalf of the disability community of the city of El Paso. The disability community in El Paso maintains ongoing communication with and works alongside municipal, statewide, and federal public officials on issues that affect people in our community. Our city has completed an entire assessment of all city departments for accessibility to include physical barriers, communications, technology, policies and procedures, and provides annual funding to address specific needs regarding impediments to city services. Advocates in our community have worked in unison using a multi-pronged advocacy approach in order to address various physical systemic and attitudinal barriers throughout our city, state, and nation. This has led to greater access to services in both the public and private sectors in areas such as transportation, healthcare, public accommodations, and employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Agencies and organizations serving people in our community have ensured that people with disabilities have easy access to services. Local nonprofits have grown their services programs in order to accommodate the needs of constituents with disabilities. Our local independent living center continues to provide services such as independent living skills, nursing home transition, and peer support among others. Our community advocates are constantly out in our city ensuring that people with disabilities are fully aware and engaged 
in issues that impact their lives. The Borderplex Workforce Solutions has various initiatives to provide work-based learning opportunities to individuals with disabilities and particularly for students with disabilities ages 14 to 22 to gain soft and hard skills for work. The disability network in our city is quick to organize itself when issues arise and, the need, and there's immediate need and attention. At the early stages of the pandemic, we are currently living in advocates in our community came together to make sure that the rights and safety of people with disabilities in our community um, were at the forefront of all discussions. We worked with our ADA coordinator to make sure uh, that any policies and procedures that would be implemented did not infringe on the rights of people with disabilities. We made sure that all communication and information distribution that our public officials delivered was made accessible to everyone. Our community will continue to work together to ensure that the rights of people with disabilities as envisioned under the Americans with Disabilities Act continues to have a positive impact throughout our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we're gonna have a shout out to the city of Fort Worth. I wanna uh, say howdy to uh, Mr. Al Henderson, the uh, Fort Worth ADA coordinator and Ms. Rainey Matthews, the Fort Worth uh, Mayor's Committee Chair. They're holding their meeting today and they have made the ADA 30 celebration part of their Mayor's Committee meeting. So let's go ahead and hear from Rainey Matthews with the city of Fort Worth. Howdy from the Fort Worth Mayor's Committee on Persons with Disabilities. My name is Rainey Doc Matthews and on behalf of the MCPD, I wish the Americans with Disabilities Act a happy 30th anniversary. As chair of the Fort Worth Mayor's Committee on Persons with Disabilities, I want to take this opportunity as we celebrate this important ADA milestone to share with you the impact this legislation has had locally in Fort Worth. Although the MCPD was created nine years before the passage of the ADA legislation, it has paved the way for the city of Fort Worth to implement public accommodation compliance improvements in the areas of housing, employment, and public transportation. These improvements include better accessibility in parks and public venues, such as our new Dickies Arena, the development of an active transportation plan a text to 911 emergency response program, new county voting and polling place disability friendly processes and equipment. Advocacy for a Tarrant County College free ride program. Increased public education and community engagement such as participation in the White Cane Safety Day and the recognition of local volunteers who in their everyday life raise awareness of living a life of value with a disability and make impactful changes in the Fort Worth community that improve opportunities for persons with disabilities. And finally, I offer a big text thank you to our partner, Lex Frieden, for being the original unstoppable advocacy voice for the ADA. Thank you, Fort Worth. 
I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, the coronavirus has affected a lot of our vacation plans. And coming up next, we're going to hear from Galveston. Although many of us have had a staycation, watching this video from Galveston, you're going to feel like you got a chance to have a short three-minute vacation from Galveston. It's, I'm proud to introduce Deb Nowinski, who uh, created this video with her mayor pro tem. And it's just amazing. Let's enjoy hearing from Galveston. I'd like to invite you to come and enjoy our beaches, our seafood, and our historical offices. I would also like to thank the ADA for allowing our city to be more accessible to everyone. And congratulate the ADA on 30 years of service, not only to local communities, but the entire nation. Hello, my name is John Gold. I love my island and I've seen money much much improvement over a long period of time the curb cuts and sidewalks and accessibility to a downtown area which is a historical district. And uh, I'm truly grateful for it because there are a lot of places that I couldn't go at one time back in the eighties or kind of places. And we, and we also have amenities of school and beach for people with disabilities. We have things called a Moby map, which is a huge map for people in wheelchairs. They'll put you in the water, and they have uh, wheelchairs that are floatable. And uh, in, in 2001, I did an article with Peter Davis, who was lifeguard, the chief lifeguard here in Galveston. I did an article in People Magazine about these wheelchairs, and they were, they were so much fun. They've updated it since then, and it's made the beach so much more accessible for people in Thanks to the ADA, now there are beaches for all of us to enjoy and come to.
Okay, the rich visuals from that video probably presented a challenge to the audio describers from ArtSpark Texas, but I hope our blind and uh, vision impaired member, members of our audience really enjoyed that uh, through ArtSpark and audio description. Up next, we're gonna hear from Hidalgo County in the Chamber of Commerce from Rio Grande Valley. Uh, in the last few years, I think that the advocates have done a really good job promoting inclusion and uh, they really opened my eyes i mean 30 years ago ada was signed into law and in that it's helped uh, start the conversation of the importance of making everybody inclusive and i've heard stories where people said that you know i, I finally get to go to a park and they may be 30 40 years old and they're finally able to participate you never want a kid uh, to show up somewhere whether it's a park or another place and feel like that there's a barrier for the, for himself or herself. I want to help help kids and, and adults and teens, everybody with disabilities. It was an elementary. I was actually discriminated by a teacher that didn't let me go on a trip due to me have, having a, another, having ADHD. Cause I felt like, like why are they treating me this way when they're treating the kids the other way? Autism is something not to be discriminated against. It's something to be rejoiced. After I graduated from college, I found finding a job. Just be yourself. Don't, doesn't matter what people think about you, whether you have disability or not. And you're, you're good and you're the best way, the way you are. Regarding hiring individuals with disabilities is one of the utmost important tasks that we face right now in the Rio Grande Valley. In order to provide equal opportunities and access to these individuals, um, they have to be able to be employed. One day sitting on a bench in Alguna Vista, a couple of mothers sat and they thought, wow, our children are growing up. What's next for them? A little bit of fear set into us and we thought, what can we do to help? They're going to knock on doors. They're going to want employment. They're going to want internships and opportunities. But we felt like at the time our community wasn't ready for it. So we thought, how can we make a grander impact? This is where the idea of the Disability Chamber of Commerce was born. We have this hope that the Disability Chamber of Commerce is going to go ahead and help execute some of the original intent behind ADA. We hope to provide corporate training sensitivity training, and a lot of trainings and webinars for adults with disabilities who want to be entrepreneurs. In the Rio Grande Valley, we have so many advocates and so many great organizations, and we've all now started to divide and conquer. And together as a regional chamber, we're getting so much done. We're moving at our own pace in the Rio Grande Valley, but you know what? We have a lot of will and we have a lot of heart. We're ready to move forward and do exactly what ADA wanted to do which is empower people with disabilities to be productive citizens of their community. We want to wish a happy anniversary to the ADA Act, and we want to tell you the Rio Grande Valley is ready to move forward as well. All right, thanks to Hidalgo County and the Rio Grande Valley for that excellent video. The reason we do this is to spark imagination across the state. We always believe the taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for the same good idea more than once. And you know, we'd like to challenge each of you, does your city have a Chamber of Commerce for people with disabilities? Uh, we hope so. So next up, we're gonna go back live to the city of Houston and hear from Mr. Richard Petty, who's the chair of the Houston Commission on People with Disabilities. Richard, let's make sure Thank we unmute. Thank you, Ron, Lucy, and members uh, and uh, staff of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Thank you for organizing this important celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I bring greetings from the 14 commissioners and alternates who serve the city of, uh, of Houston as the commission of uh, the Houston's Commission on Disabilities. And uh, a number of us were appointed to the commission in 2016, about half of the commission and uh, many of us have remained. Since our appointment, Houston has hosted the Super Bowl, the World Series, Hurricane Harvey, 
several tropical weather events and the COVID-19 virus. There has been much for the Houston Commission to do and our colleagues, our city colleagues and others to accomplish. With the work of the Houston Commission and the, the uh, leadership of Commissioner Shelley Townsend, Commission, Houston's Commission has addressed the needs of citizens with disabilities in recovering from Hurricane Harvey during the, uh, during the weather event. Uh, commissioners swung into action to assist families in Southeast Texas to receive vitally needed medications for their children that had not been delivered as they should have been. It even took an airdrop to uh, provide, uh, provide those medications. And Houston's commission has supported employment of youth with disabilities in their transition to employment, where Commissioner Benigno Aceves has led the leaping in the f into the future activity for the past four years, which will continue to help youth prepare to become fully employed and to become fully part of communities. Houston's commission has worked to improve access to public transit and to the streets and sidewalks and crosswalks of the city of Houston. In 2019, the commission appointed a special task force to address, um, to address the safety of Houston's streets. And that was necessary because people with disabilities were not able to travel safely. There had been some high profile crashes here in Houston. And people, of course, that affected people who used public transit. It affected people who were moving about the city. And much work has been done and much improvement has been created. In addition, the commission has worked to improve law enforcement and first responder response to, <coughs> excuse me, please, the disability community here in Houston under the leadership of Commissioner Emanuel Iziashi. And that work is continuing and will grow. And now the commission is continuing to focus its attention to people who have been forced or could be forced into institutions because of the failure of home-based services, because of a lack of housing, because of food insecurity and other challenges. We've been able to work closely with the Houston Mayor's Office for people with disability, disabilities uh, with Director Gabe Cazares and his staff. And the commission has and will continue to address this most important need, which all of us in our communities must address. And we encourage that this encourage other committees around the state and other people with disabilities, other organizations, to address the needs of people with disabilities, to make sure that people are not forced into institutions or that they can transition back out, back into the community. And we look forward to doing this important work. Thank you all. Thank you, Richard. All right, we have about seven more cities to hear from. We're running a bit behind on the clock, but let's shoot back up to the Metroplex and hear from the city of Irving and Mayor Richard Stauffer. I'm Irving Mayor Rick Stouffer. Our city is honored to join you in celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In Irving, we have lots to be proud of. 
We have therapeutic recreation programs for both adults and children, ADA accessible playgrounds throughout the city, as well as a couple of initiatives we'd like to spotlight. First up, Aquastars. The city's Aquastar program allows children with special needs in their families a chance to have access to one of our premier swimming facilities and have a splash in a fun and safe way. Next, we want to show our Miracle League field, where teams participate in baseball through our local YMCA. Here's the story. It's time to play ball. And in the Miracle League, the rules are a little different. The most important role is to have fun. There you go! Here, the pride and the impact are more important than precise rules. Organizers and parents see the difference this game can make. Oh, I'm so proud of it. I, I try not to get too emotional about it, but, you know, we just, we're just so proud of him. And, and the courage that it takes for him to come out there and, and do this. They need this to feel more comfortable around other people and be more social. Every time they come across that plate and I got a home run, you can't help but just be excited for them because they are so excited. There you go. Good job. Good job. Once again, congratulations on all the progress throughout the state in 30 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mayor. We're going to head far out to West Texas, to the West Texas Plains, to a beautiful city, the city of Lubbock. And we'll hear from Michelle Crane with the Life Center for Independent Living. Welcome, Miss Crane. Thank you. Sorry, I almost forgot to uh, unmute. So uh, thank you and uh, greetings on behalf of uh, our great city of Lubbock. And I would like to share with you one of our uh, really important and um, great initiatives that we're doing in the Hub City. So we have a initiative called Hub City Access. It's a collaboration of the Lester E. Walcott Memorial Foundation and the Life Run Center. And it was galvanized by the inspirational strength of our late Christy Gutierrez, which was a local uh, advocate in, in, in Lubbock. Uh, Hub City Access began as a local initiative comprised of community advocates, healthcare providers, and individuals with disabilities while battling a rare form of cancer and eventually becoming wheelchair mobile, Christy devoted the latter part of her life advocating for a more accessible community. It is in her honor that we, excuse me, in her memory that Hub City Access endeavors to make our community accessible to all of its residents and visitors, thereby empowering those with disabilities to fully access our great city of Lubbock. Hub City Access objective is to not only address the physical barriers that challenge people with disability, but the attitudinal barriers that can often hinder change. HCA strives to promote awareness among public and private entities and recognizing that people with disabilities through full inclusion can live more independently, enjoy freedom of choice, pursue meaningful and productive lives, and contribute to and experience the economic benefits of an engaged community. The annual Focus on Access Gala is our way of celebrating the barriers we have overcome as a community and by honoring businesses and individuals that embrace our mission. During our gala, Hub City Access also presents a $5,000 contribution towards community initiatives that advance the spirit of independence, disability empowerment, and full inclusion. Having said that, we have, during, during the gala, excuse me, we pretty much party like it's 2099, but we don't lose sight of what we are there for and the cause that we are there for. And we proceed when, when it comes to the accessibility in our community, um, we keep in mind the, well, we've adopted the mantra pretty much, and many of you might be familiar with this quote, a community that excludes even one of its members is no community at all. And um, basically what we're going to be looking at as far as future 
initiatives is uh, our initiative, and many of you have mentioned this earlier, is um, diverting individuals from institutions. And that's going to be uh, our one of our initiatives as far as diverting individuals from hospitals out into the community. The, the important thing is to make sure that individuals don't end up in nursing homes to begin with. So we feel that that is one of our major, major goals uh, in this, uh, you know, age of, of COVID-19. So uh, we would like to, and we know we're running behind, but we would like to say thank you to the governor's committee for allowing us to be a part of this and um, happy, you know, 30th ADA. Thank you, Ms. Crane. Let's head on up to the Metroplex again to Collin County and check in with my old hometown, Plano, Texas. Uh, Ms. Julie Espinosa. Hello, my name is Brittany Miles, and I want to tell you why I am Plano proud as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the ADA. I'm a disability employment advocate for my possibilities located in Plano, Texas. I am also the Texas APSI president. APSI is the only national organization that represents employment first, the principle that people with disabilities are capable and deserve integrated employment and should be compensated at or above minimum wage. I also serve on the Dallas Mayor's Committee for the Employment of People with Disabilities, also known as employability. This new and beautiful playground is located within Windhaven Meadows Park in Plano, Texas, and it goes above and beyond ADA standards. Before the pandemic, I would take my four-year-old son to this playground and was witness to all abilities playing together, hopefully a sign of a new generation growing up in an inclusive environment. As an employment advocate for people with disabilities, I would like to celebrate corporations that have locations in Plano that have inclusive hiring practices and actively recruit adults with disabilities. The ADA made it possible for employees with disabilities to get the accommodations they need to be successful in the workplace. But now, companies are going a step further and ensuring that their staff with disabilities are not only accommodated, but also included and valued. Plano is the home of the nonprofit I work for, My Possibilities. We have a campus for continuing education and employment training. We also have a future housing development for a unique community that will offer ADA accessible housing for people with and without disabilities, accompanied with services to help them access their community. And we are establishing a business district called Impact, where retailers will provide paid internship opportunities for people with disabilities in preparation for competitive employment. Impact's first business venture is Soap Hope, an online retailer that employs people with disabilities and gives back to the disability community through the Impact Foundation. I would now like to introduce Juliet Espinoza of Reach of Plano to introduce self-advocate Plano residents who will give their perspective of how the ADA has changed their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. I wanted to say that I am happy to start this with something that is important to me. And then I'm gonna sandwich a lot of things about Plano in, and I'm gonna end it with something that I'm thrilled to say to you all today. Um, first off, I want to thank the Texas Governor's Committee for putting this virtual event together. I am wearing a black t-shirt that you can't see, but it is an 80, 30 year anniversary ADA shirt designed by a, a good friend and leader in the disability rights community, Stephanie Woodward and Ann Dart Washington. And it says, lead on. And when I see that, I can hear Yoshiko Dart saying those words, lead on. So I appreciate that physical touch with the virtual event. I'm also wearing a really nice little ADA celebration button that I got from Adapta Texas. I don't know who designed it, but all these things that we can all have to physically bring the celebration to us, I really appreciate. Um, so I talked to many people that live in Plano, Texas with disabilities to see what are they celebrating about the ADA. And I, I ask agencies too what they're hearing. So Number one, people in Plano appreciate the city of Plano's progressive stance on embracing the ADA, universal design, and the input of people with disabilities in planning the city's growth. 
and access to the connections to the other surrounding cities. I know that when Lex Frieden spoke, he spoke about Steve Bartlett, you know, from Dallas, you know, talking with them about the ADA. Well, I worked at the Dallas Center for Independent Living 30 years ago, and I remember when the ADA was signed, and I remember Steve Bartlett coming in specifically to talk to staff and people with disabilities. I feel that same connection with the city of Plano. We have had so many employees from the city of Plano come in to get our input on things, making sure that they are inclusive um, for people with disabilities. Also, we have a lot of people with disabilities that come in that work for some of these large corporations that come to the area. And it's great to see that happen. Um, so we also have a lot of little groups of advocates in Plano. Um, I just wanna say that we have people that are very supportive of other groups that are larger within the state of Texas. So there is a tight connection. There's Collin County Democrats with Disabilities. We've had several Miss Wheelchair Texas people come from Plano, Texas, woo -hoo, and they, they come back to their hometown and support. Um, and again, the relationship with the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Transportation. I was very happy to hear people with disabilities say, what are they happy about under ADA? And they said transportation. There are a lot of problems with transportation, but apparently they do appreciate that it is accessible. Um, also, we have accessible educational opportunities in Plano. We are very fortunate that we have connections with um, multiple universities for getting degrees in all kinds of subjects. So that's good to see that happen for young people going through college. We have adaptive sports in Plano, Texas. We have, you know, Rise Sports, Camp Craig Allen, accessible parks and accessible equestrian facilities. We have disability service organizations that are very devoted to the ADA. We have Reach of Plano, yay, my possibilities. We have accessible shelters. I did not see that when I first started working in Plano, but they have really changed quite a bit to be accommodating for people that need service animals or attendants, um, wheelchair access. And Justin Dar is the father of the ADA. I think he would be thrilled to hear what I was thrilled to hear. Um, I know that when he did town hall meetings all through Texas, he asked people to write him a letter in the next two weeks of every single time they were discriminated against. And all the letters, people felt social discrimination. They felt that they were treated badly. They were treated like second-class citizens. So when I asked people what they thought was different because of ADA, when I heard people saying that they feel the respect that is given to their civil rights as people with disabilities under the ADA, I thought then he would be thrilled because the dream has been fulfilled. ADA has taught society, you don't treat people with disabilities as second class citizens. We know we have our rights and society knows we have our rights. All right, Julie, thank you very much for those remarks. Thank you for taking care of my old hometown and keeping it accessible. Let's uh, now head down to the Alamo City, to the city of San Antonio and hear from Ms. Jane Passione uh, with a video recorded uh, from the city of San Antonio. San Antonio is a city where people with disabilities work, live and play a city rich in history, bustling with culture, and booming with modern attractions. Hi, I'm Jane Passioni. I work at the San Antonio Air Foundation, which helps donors provide financial support to our community. Let me take you on a tour to share some San Antonio highlights. First up, Morgan's Wonderland, which is an all about inclusion. The ultra accessible theme park provides fun for people with and without disabilities. The theme park has received international attention with games, activities, and rides spread across 25 acres. The fun includes a wheelchair accessible Ferris wheel and Morgan's Inspiration Island water park. Speaking of international attention, any trip to the Alamo City should include shopping, dining, or strolling along the accessible and world famous San Antonio Riverwalk. The Riverwalk spans 15 miles and the beautiful trail can lead you to the Museum Reach and to the San Antonio Missions, which are our UNESCO World Heritage Site. 
San Antonio also is the proud home of USAA. The company has its headquarters here and has received high rankings on the Disability Equity Index, which measures the company's disability inclusion efforts. The San Antonio Lighthouse for the Blind is well known for its commitment to training, educating, and employing the blind and visually impaired. The Lighthouse is a leader in manufacturing American-made products to support our U.S. military services. Blind and vision impaired staff make up half of the Lighthouse workforce. They receive competitive pay and benefits from the nonprofit, which also operates the Senior Center and the state's only educational program for blind children. Also known as Military City USA, San Antonio has the largest concentration of military bases in the country. We're home to Joint Base San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston. It's the largest medical center under the Department of Defense. Since 2007, San Antonio has been home for the Center for the Intrepid, a $55 million state-of-the-art physical rehabilitation center at Brook Army Medical Center. The Center for the Intrepid provides critical care for all military personnel, patients with severe burns, amputations, and other traumatic injuries. If you want to stay active, you can always find something to do outdoors, at the park, along miles of connected greenway trails, or at a city recreation facilities that offer adaptive sports. These are just a few highlights, but the Alamo City offers so much more, especially when it comes to food and tacos. San Antonio is truly a place where people with disabilities can work, live, and play. All right, great to hear from San Antonio. We still have three cities left and over 400 members of the audience hanging in there with us as we run a little bit late. Up next, let's hear from Mayor Pro Tem Judy Morales with the City of Temple, a longtime advocate and friend of people with disabilities. Happy birthday, ADA. Welcome to Temple, Texas and Bell County. My name is Judy Morales and I'm a founder member of the Bell County Judge and Commissioners Committee for Persons with Disabilities. I also serve as mayor pro tem for the city of Temple. In 1978, my son Rusty was in a terrible motorcycle accident and was not expected to live, but God had other plans. As he slowly began his recovery, my family learned firsthand that accessibility was an obstacle that desperately needed attention in our city. In the 1970s, very few places were accessible. Resources for the disabled were hard to find and public transportation was not even an option. This was an eye opening and kick started our journey to find resources for my son, as well as countless others just like him. Thankfully, we connected with the governor's committee, which was called the governor's employment committee of the handicap. The state director at the time, John Burns visited Temple and assisted us in creating the Temple Mayor's Committee for Employment of the Handicap. As our new committee began to talking to different groups and organizations, interest grew and by the early 1980s, we were full steam ahead with over hundred people involved. Our main goal was improving the quality of life for the disabled by working to eliminate physical and psychological barriers those with disabilities face every day. With former Mayor John Simmons support, we led the charge to begin removal of architecture barriers as well as created reserved handicapped parking spaces in the downtown area. Other important projects were expanded educational opportunities within our school district, improving employment opportunities, and providing tax credit and additional resources for those employing the disabled. A huge concern in our area at that time was a lack of accessible public transportation. The committee worked with the city and conducted several community surveys and by the early 1990s, Hill Country Community Action obtained federal funds and began offering public transportation to our residents, which included handicapped lifts. Over the years, our committee evolved and expanded, and by 1994, then John Garth, our judge, recognized the important work being done in our area and expanded and created the Bell County Judge and Commissioner's Committee for Persons with Disabilities which continues to meet every month. Additional programs have been established like HOCTO, which offers daily hands-on support to the disabled. Other areas of the city have been improved, such as playgrounds and pools, so children and disabil with disabilities can enjoy a day of fun in the park. The committee has also worked hard on awareness events and campaigns and hosts an annual banquet each October called the Rusty's Award to recognize and honor 
persons with disabilities to show their abilities. We are so pleased that our governor continues to hold the, uphold the contributions of those with disabilities. We are extremely proud of the support and continuing involvement by the city of Temple and Bell County in working to assure all citizens can continue to live, play, work, and enjoy everything Temple and Bell County has to offer. We look forward to what the future brings along with continuing this important work. Again, congratulations and happy birthday, ADA. All right, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Judy Morales. Let's now head over to the Rose of Texas uh, in East Texas, Tyler, and hear from uh, Sharon Roberts, the city's ADA coordinator. I just want to say this is pretty cool and uh, my heart's pretty full. I just stand here and look at uh, the fact that we got here. I mean, we've been talking about this for almost seven years. I know that everybody's so excited to get to what's behind me that you're looking at right now. And some of you've already been on it and you know exactly where you want to go back to. We are a small but a pretty mighty club. And so we um, we, we do what we can to to fulfill our mission, and that's to create mobility and independence for those with disabilities in our community. And I think this is a big part of what we do. So um, so we're so excited to provide this to our community. Uh, my name is Casey Bryans, but uh, nobody really cares about me. I'm the dad of Jack Bryans. And he says, thank you. And that's really all I have to say is thank you. Why in the world would you spend three quarters of a million dollars on a, a park? Tyler is blessed with many wonderful parks that are beautiful and great, but this is why. Um, it's for Jack and it's for all these other great kids out here. So I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart as parents. Um, Jack is six, Jack goes to kindergarten, Jack lost a tooth last night and Jack loves to play. And uh, now he's got a safe place so thank you to each person that's here. Thank you to each uh, company and individual that donated. Um, and Jack's saying thank you, thank you, thank you, because it is fun. And it is a blessing to the whole community and to kids just like Jack. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> 30 years ago this day, President George H.W. Bush signed the ADA. This beautiful park where all can play exists as Tyler does display inclusion, accessibility, a bit array. Happy 30th birthday, ADA. All right. Let's uh, now move to the heart of Texas and check in with the uh, city of Waco and Mr. Brown. Thank you, Ron. Can y'all hear me? Loud and clear. Great, great. Well, I want to thank you first for allowing the city of Waco to um, just celebrate 30 years with the American with Disabilities Act. We're excited about what um, is happening here um, in Waco. Over the past year, we've seen um, visitors, the numbers increase uh, up to close to 3 million per year. Um, what that's done is it's really brought an awareness um, to the community about um, transportation, which I know is always a problem. Um, but with that, uh, downtown has started um, building some bike lanes. And so what the city was able to do is we were able to leverage um, some of that and make sure that those bike lanes um, met the specifications of the ADA um, so that we were able to um, use those uh, for also transportation um, for the differently um, abled individuals. Um, it's special to me, um, mainly because I have a special needs child. And so I see the importance of the next generation uh, coming up, not just here in Waco, but other places that we identify um, this next generation um, to continue to grow um, and eliminate barriers for those with disabilities uh, as we continue to try to help them gain more access to um, needs and services that they have. Um, another thing that in Waco that's really exciting is um, 
the heart of Texas Council of Governments, um, mainly just uh, the city of Waco, did a land swap um, with Baylor um, last year. And due to that, um, uh, the, the land is a 105 acre tract and it's where Floyd Casey Stadium used to be is where Baylor you know, played football. Um, that was demolished and now it's going to be what they're gonna call Floyd Casey Village Center. Um, and within that center, it's gonna include close to 300 um, housing uh, um, dwellings as well as some shops and some other retail um, buildings. And so within that, there's going to be uh, a section of homes um, that are gonna be built for those um, with disabilities. Um, so we're excited about that, that that is, is on the top of the list of, of many um, that they're focusing on um, that's going to be coming to Waco and that is going to be um, provided um, for those with disabilities as well. Um, I'm a part of the chamber on the board here in Waco. And one of the things we did here recently is we did a seminar that talked to businesses about um, inclusion in the workplace um, for those that are differently abled. And what I found was that it's not that the businesses did not want to um, make their businesses more uh, inclusive in hiring, but it was just a matter of they just didn't know how. And so one thing that the Waco Mayor's Committee of People with Disabilities are doing here in Waco is we're going to make it uh, a priority to educate businesses and work with them um, to understand what it means um, from the perspective of someone with a disability um, to um, be included uh, so that they can have jobs and they can have some of the opportunities um, that uh, are out there when it comes to employment. Um, with that, we've um, also um, created a community access team here um, in Waco. And what that consists of is we've reached out to different professionals that provide services in the community. Um, so that whenever we get a phone call of people asking, hey, do you know of somebody that um, has this particular or specific service for someone with a disability, we're able to automatically connect them um, as quickly as possible with that individual. Um, and so we've, we've started that um, community access team and um, we're, you know, really looking forward to not just working within, you know, the Waco, um, McLennan County area, but we're looking to work with all local organizations within, within that area to make um, the city of Waco stronger um, in order to meet the needs of those um, with disabilities. So those are just a few of the things that we're working on. Um, and uh, don't, don't want to forget, you know, our special needs kids that are out there, um, that are participating in sports. Um, that's become a huge part of um, Waco. Um, 30 years uh, this year, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, is our Challenger Little League Baseball um, anniversary. And, and there's going to be some new um, things going on there and, and Special Olympics, um, no limitations. There's some great organizations um, and, and we're really excited. Um, then, uh, you know, in addition to that, um, we just want to, we just want to thank everyone um, out there that is um, supporting those um, here in the community um, to, like I said, eliminate um, barriers and grow accessible um, opportunities for those with disabilities. Um, so again, thank you for allowing the city of Waco to celebrate this time and this program with you guys. And um, again, uh, just happy birthday, ADA. So All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mr. Black. Ron, I so apologize. So this is an image of the city of Austin on the slides. It says city of Waco. So that was my mistake. Well, you know what? I'll forgive you, I guess. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you, you know, I'll go ahead and plug this. I am a Baylor Bear. So I know y'all mentioned the University of Texas. So so the Bears will will forgive you. 
<laughs> All right. Yeah, we've had more than a few Longhorns today. I promise it was an oversight. Hey, Randy, let's uh, check back in with Dallas. I, I heard Crystal Baker live here earlier, and I I thought we had a video on the screen right now. Give me one second. And All right. And I want to thank the the four hundred of you that have hung in there. You are the people that come to the party and stay late, and and we appreciate it. We are running late, and uh, after this, we're going to have a few closing remarks and a few thank yous, and then. Uh, we're going to have some historic footage that we're going to run for the rest of the afternoon and partner videos, but we're getting pretty close to the end here. Greetings from Dallas, home to five major league sports teams where the term Super Bowl was coined, the birthplace of Stevie Ray Vaughan, where the frozen margarita machine was invented, has the largest urban arts district in the United States, has the tallest cowboy in Texas, and is the setting for one of the longest running full hour primetime dramas in Dallas. As the number one visitor and leisure destination in Texas, the city of Dallas is renewing its commitment to the ADA by updating its ADA transition plan, which will identify and remove access barriers to city programs, services, and activities. One example of this is a new sidewalk master plan that will provide better connectivity within neighborhoods and public transportation. The city continues to work with advocacy groups and other local entities, such as employability, which serves as a resource to businesses providing education tools and training, as well as scholarships to people with disabilities who are pursuing further education. Their vision has been supported by city, state, and federal leaders, as well as corporations like AT&T. As one of 23 Fortune 500 companies in Dallas, AT&T understands that accessibility is more than a word. It's a commitment to connect people to the world around them. At AT&T, we believe that people with disabilities should be included in all aspects of society, that our products and services should be accessible, and that the success of our business is dependent upon using the skills and talents of all people. With plans this year to unveil our brand new AT&T Discovery District downtown, just like the city of Dallas, AT&T included disability advocacy groups in the planning of the Discovery District to ensure it can be enjoyed by all with the inclusion of a hearing loop system, audio descriptions, amplification, and wheelchair access. AT&T believes it's important for companies to take proactive steps to make products and services accessible. That's why our Chief Accessibility Office serves as a central hub for accessibility-related expertise, supports processes to create accessible products, offers accessibility training to our employees, and is home to a world-renowned traveling accessibility awareness lab. To reward employees who go above and beyond their regular job duties in promoting accessibility and inclusion, AT&T created the Accessibility in Action Award. In addition, an internal accessibility and inclusion initiative was launched to create a more inclusive and engaging environment. And we boast four employee resource groups supporting people with disabilities. At AT&T, we believe a diverse workforce benefits our customers. We have created an accessible job application process and piloted two internship programs for adults with autism. Once employed, we offer diverse and high potential professional development opportunities. ADA, the city of Dallas and AT&T have learned a lot from you in the past 30 years. Here's to another 30. Happy birthday, ADA. Thank you, Crystal Baker, and thank you, AT&T and the city of Dallas. Looking across the landscape of the Lone Star State and the 20 cities we heard from, many of the challenges are the same, challenges of accessible transportation, inclusive accessible programs and services, accessible playscapes, but the solution is also the same. Uh, I'm reminded of Bob Kafka's words about uh, taking the kinetic energy of uh, or the potential energy of advocates and turning it into the kinetic energy of advocacy. And I encourage all of you in all of these communities to be at the table. Uh, make sure that your voice is heard by being involved in local government and making your community a model for accessibility. So we're going to go on to closing remarks since we're running behind. Uh, as I look back on the anniversary of the ADA, I recall being involved in the planning of our state's 10th anniversary of the ADA. And our goal back then was to educate the public that the ADA was a civil rights law. We literally passed the torch from the Martin Luther King Center in Atlanta uh, and linked the civil rights movement of the 1960s to the Americans with Disabilities Act civil rights movement of the 2000s. 
when I look at the 30th anniversary of the ADA, uh, what it means to me is that uh, we have to look back before we can move ahead. And then we need to move ahead by empowering the ADA generation to help us lead forward uh, with progressing in the 21st century under the ADA. I, I remember many years ago, a reporter once asked me when we would be finished implementing the ADA. Uh, there used to be a tradition where ADAPT would file uh, X number of lawsuits on the anniversary of the ADA. Uh, if it was the ninth anniversary, there would be nine lawsuits. And likewise, on the mayor's committee, we would announce nine accomplishments from the city of Austin to match the anniversary. Uh, but uh, the ADA is not measured in mere numbers. The ADA is not a destination, it's a journey. Uh, we can measure uh, the number of accessible websites. We can number the, measure the number of linear feet of sidewalks or the number of curb ramps. Uh, there's lots of ways to measure uh, the success of the ADA. But for me, I measure the success of the ADA by the number of relationships that we form and working together in our communities to solve these challenges. And I'm very proud that uh, we strengthen those relationships through the planning of this ADA anniversary celebration. Uh, I'd like to start by recognizing the 21 partners that came together on the anniversary of the ADA. And uh, Randy, if you could put those up on the screen and let me know when you've got them up there, I'll, I'll go ahead and call them out. I have them up there, Ron. All right, we have the American Council of the Blind of Texas, led by Ms. Peggy Garrett. We've got ADAPT of Texas, scrolling down here. We've got our ArtSpark Texas, and thank you ArtSpark Texas for providing audio description today. Uh, thank you, April and Celia. We have the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, Disability Rights Texas, the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, Nobility Incorporated, the National Federation of the Blind of Texas, uh, Personal Attendant Coalition of Texas, or PACT. Uh, we have Rev Up Texas. We have the Southwest ADA Center. Uh, we have Texas Association of the Deaf, the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities, the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, Texas Parent to Parent, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, the Texas Workforce Commission and Texas Workforce Solutions, the Texas State Independent Living Council, the Arc of Texas, the University of Texas at Austin uh, Disability Studies Program, Texas Department of Transportation, our lead partner. So I'd like to thank all 21 of those uh, partners for making today's event possible. And then I wanna get into some very specific thank yous. We talked about how TxDOT was our, our lead partner and this celebration came out of the vision of one person in particular. I'd like to thank Ms. Juanita Weber uh, and uh, the Civil Rights Department at the Texas Department of Transportation. And uh, Originally, this uh, was intended to be an in-person event. We're all gonna look back uh, at 2020 as that very strange year where we didn't get to come together in person and none of us wore shoes to work. Uh, but it's been uh, an opportunity for us to strengthen our relationships using technology and using uh, accessible technology. So in talking to Juanita as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic was unfolding, we realized we still need to do this. We still need to bring Texans with disabilities together to celebrate the ADA. And so I'm glad that we could execute on Juanita's vision for an ADA celebration. And we have something we'd like to present to you, which we will show on camera and then mail to you. Uh, Randy, if you could hold up this Texas flag that we had flown over the Capitol, not only in honor of Juanita Weber, but all the hardworking Randy staff at the- Weber. The Texas flag. Not only for Juanita, but for all of the hardworking staff at the Texas Department of Transportation and the communications team and uh, the Civil Rights Office for their hard work in making this uh, not a possibility, but a reality. I want to thank uh, Deborah Medlin and Aisha Shawry from communications for uh, helping prolifically communicate. I also want to thank our friends with Disability Rights, Rights Texas, Edie Surtees, and their communication team who put out some great information about this event. Now, one of our unsung heroes today has also been Mr. Andy Weir from the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. 
TSPVI was uh, late in coming to the table, not because they weren't willing, but frankly, we were late in asking them. So they didn't uh, show up on the slide that shows the 21 partners, but clearly TSPVI has been an excellent 22nd partner and all the videos and the, the multimedia work that took place to make this happen couldn't have been possible without Andy Weir's hard work. Uh, I'd also like to thank Commander Lee uh, Pritchard and uh, the Disabled American Veterans Lone Star Chapter for providing the color guard this morning uh, and for uh, Irene Telialagua uh, for providing uh, the national anthem. The national anthem is hard to sing anytime, but singing it into a uh, web microphone through Zoom uh, is even more challenging. And I think she did a great job. Really appreciate that. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my team for uh, keeping the lights on in the office and keeping things moving uh, to Nancy, Monica, and Lindsay. Y'all do a great job every single day, and I, I'm grateful to be able to work with you. Uh, Lindsay, thank you for communicating about all the ADA activities throughout the month. There's one person in particular that I'd like to end with thanking on. This individual has attended every one of our ADA planning meetings, every one of our ADA training webinars throughout the month and has put countless hours into making this happen. And that's Ms. Randy Turner. Uh, Randy, uh, you've done an excellent job. I told you that July was gonna be a challenging month and you stood up well to that challenge uh, and fulfilled the spirit of the ADA. So that concludes this part of our program. What we have going forward for the rest of the afternoon, we're going to stream our partner videos. These are short uh, greeting videos from the 21 partners that I had just mentioned. And then we have some historic footage from the 10th anniversary of the ADA uh, that will also stream and uh, it's uh, fully captioned. So. This concludes our ADA celebration. Uh, Randy, is there anything else you need to add before we, uh, we're gonna leave the stream open to show those videos, but uh, that concludes the live part of our presentation. No, Ron, I don't think there's anything else. I'll all right. The videos Cap are all captioned, um, but we will lose the streamed caption and the interpreter services um, at one o'clock. All right. Thank you all. Happy anniversary. Art Spark, Texas, sparking the creative in everyone. Happy 30th birthday to the Americans with Disabilities Act from the team at Art Spark, Texas. Hi, I'm Celia Hughes, the Executive Director of ArtSpark Texas. ArtSpark Texas challenges perceptions of how people contribute by creating an arts-inspired, inclusive community of individuals with diverse abilities. Like the ADA, we celebrate accessibility for all. So, you're an artist. Chances are you want to connect to the arts community in your area. But where do you start? Start with Art Spark Texas. We spark the creative in everyone by connecting artists with community programs, events, and classes that are accessible to all. We work to create positive change in the lives of people with diverse interests and abilities through exhibitions and demonstrations, classes, workshops, and internships. We reach the public through community-based residencies and groundbreaking performance in dance, theater, spoken word, and music. Visit our website at artsparktx.org, join our newsletter, and find us on social media to connect with your art community. Produced by the Artspark Texas Video Production Class. Thank you to our funders, Texas Commission on the Arts, St. David's Foundation, Cultural Arts, City of Austin, National Endowments for the Arts, Creative Forces, Austin Public Library, and Donald B. Hamill Foundation. My name is Emma Faye Van Kuhn, and I'm on the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, appointed by Governor Greg Abbott 
to this amazing committee. I'm here representing the staff and members of the GCPD. And I am the founder and executive director of an organization, Aid the Silent, that provides resources like classroom equipment, CNAs, and ASL lessons for families to learn together and speech therapy for disadvantaged children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And the committee, GCPD, we have a historic relationship with the ADA. The father of the ADA, Justin Dart, was a committee chair member of the GCPD. So thank you for inviting us to be here today. The ADA is very personal when my battle started when I was just seven years old against the largest movie theater to provide captioning for the deaf. I won that battle when I was about 20, and we had the first open night for this movie theater to provide access for deaf attendees. Thank you to Ms. Juanita Weber, working with the Texas Department of Transportation for having this vision to have the anniversary planning started. Happy anniversary to the ADA, the 30th anniversary. Thank you for all you movers and shakers that had to make this happen so that my world and my access, even just getting my service dog tank, would be an opportunity that I could live my life and the quality of my life great. So for the future, we're planning that this will be a long time um, victory for those with disabilities, that this was the starting place and we're not done yet. Square images of posters and leaders of the disability rights movement fall into a pattern. John Hoffman and others with Tom Wilson holding a flag. Deborah Jackson holding a poster. Vote as if your life depends on it, because it does. Justin Dart. Chris Goad holds a poster. Label jars, not people. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Adapt. James Payne holds a poster. Bob Kafka. Hands fell vote in ASL. Larry Hughes holds a rev up poster. Sandra Petty, Stephen Ty. I change the world when I vote. You change the world when you vote. And we change the world when we vote together. The square images fill in the space to form the words rev up. Register, educate, vote. Use your power. Make the disability vote count. www.revuptexas.org. My name is Beth Stalvey. I am the Executive Director of the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities. We are so pleased to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Our Council's mission is in line with the ADA in promoting inclusion, independence, and an individual's right to control their own lives. We recognize that the passing of the ADA 30 years ago was the culmination of ongoing advocacy and recognition that people with disabilities have the same rights as all citizens. We are proud to continue to work today with advocates and partners across our state to realize the vision of the ADA in our schools, workplaces, and communities that honor the rights of all Texans with disabilities. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm Brian Francis, Executive Director with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. A lot of you know us as TDLR. First of all, I am so proud to, to be here and welcome you and also wish the ADA a happy 30th anniversary. What an incredible milestone. So our agency, we have the privilege to, to play just a small part in increasing the accessibility options for all Texans whether it's through our Elimination of Architectural Barriers program or even our new program of Transportation Network Companies. We're part of this process and we're excited to be a part of it. I'm also proud and humbled by the fact that we were able to participate on the planning committee for this commemoration. There's been a lot of hard work. A lot of great speakers have been lined up from the great state of Texas as well as across the nation. Speakers are gonna talk about issues on, on advocacy and 
and, and inclusion and, and hiring practices and transportation. These are important critical cornerstones to this thing that we call accessibility. My agency's mission is very simple. It's to earn the trust of Texans every day. Our vision is even more simple. It's to be the best. And those two elements, they were right there the day when, when then President George Bush signed into law the ADA, July 26, 1990. What a special day. It gave us an opportunity to hear those words that let the, the walls of exclusion come tumbling down. Now, we all know they haven't completely fallen down. There's a few bricks left, and we're going to get after those bricks. But I just want to welcome you and, and wish the ADA a happy 30th, and let's get to working for the next 30 years of making Texas even more accessible. Thank you. As we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, your Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is redoubling its commitment to make sure that the great Texas outdoors are made safe and accessible for all Texans to use and enjoy. That pledge extends to whether we're creating a new paddling trail along one of our many lakes or rivers or streams or along the great Texas coast, whether we're developing a campsite or a trail or a new building or facility inside a state park, whether we're opening up a place where Texans can go to hunt or fish or bird watch or otherwise enjoy all of the bounty of mother nature, launching a new program to help introduce Texans to the outdoors and the stewardship of our home ground. We're committed to making sure that all Texans have access to those places and those programs. This year, we're doing a couple of other things that are pretty special. Uh, one, we are setting up a new accessibility committee comprised of leaders from around the state that are going to provide advice and counsel and guidance about how we can make the mission and work and programs of this department even more accessible to people inside our state. In addition, we've launched a, a statewide assessment of all of our thousands of facilities across our state parks, and wildlife management areas, our fish hatcheries, and our law enforcement offices to make sure that those places are indeed truly accessible to all Texans. The ADA is an integral part of the mission of this department, and we're committed to making sure that our work to steward our home ground and to provide opportunities to get out and enjoy the best of our home ground are truly accessible to all Texans. July 26, 2020 marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of the landmark civil rights legislation, the Americans with the Disabilities Act or the ADA, which prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities and guarantees them the same opportunities to participate in our communities, have equal employment opportunities and access to public services. Thanks to the ADA, inclusion has increased as millions of people with disabilities have experienced improved access to employment, government services, and employment by greater access with their communities. While the ADA made requirements for the removal of physical barriers and prohibits discrimination in hiring, barriers of attitude persist about the capabilities of individuals with disabilities. The Texas Workforce Commission is committed to increasing inclusion and employment opportunities for people with disabilities. As the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us all to find solutions so we can continue to work and live our lives, individuals with disabilities have been adapting and problem solving all along. TWC has a long history of assisting individuals to find and maintain employment. Above all, our goal is to develop the human potential of every Texan that wants a job and to make sure they have the right tools to be successful. If you are an employer planning to rebuild your workforce, creating inclusion teams will help you thrive and to be better prepared to adapt to change, making a priority to seek more candidates with disabilities. If you are a coworker leading a team, be aware that at least one person on the team is likely to have a disability. Be mindful and listen actively so that everyone's voice is heard. If you are an educator, parent, or student with a disability, be empowered to take advantage of our state's workplace readiness programs, ensuring a smooth transition to employment or post-secondary education. If you are a person with a disability, we are ready to assist you 
with professional vocational rehabilitation services through Texas Workforce Solutions Vocational Rehabilitation Services. This October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. This year's theme is increasing access and opportunity. That is a mission that the Texas Workforce Commission takes to heart throughout the year. Our mission is to serve all Texans. The 10th anniversary the celebration of the ADA signing Waterloo of the Park. landmark Americans for Disabilities Act, every man, woman, and child with a disability can now pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. I now lift my pen to sign this Americans with Disability Act and say, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. God bless you all. It was the greatest expansion of civil rights in 30 years. The Americans with Disabilities Act. This historic legislation protects people with disabilities from discrimination in the areas of employment, public services, public accommodations, and telecommunications. Austin is part of a national 23 city tour for the ADA Torch Run. Our Erica Olivares joins us live now from downtown Austin with further details, Erica. Good morning, Chris. This morning's Torch Relay is an opportunity to recognize the 10-year anniversary of ADA, but it's also a chance organizers say to be able to work toward accessibility. Happy birthday, ADA! We are here today to honor the Torch because we know that love and organizing win the day. The passage of ADA was a landmark in civil rights law for people with disabilities. Delivering to the disability community the promise inherent in our nation's founding. America, America, God shed his grace on me. We want the mental barriers to drop and we want the spirit of the ADA to rise up. That spirit says, yes, people with disabilities can do and will do in an accessible environment. We all are human beings. We all deserve to have the right to life, to have the right to passage, the right to be able to do anything we want to do. I commend the city of Austin and will make sure the city and our city of Austin enhance the availability for people with physical disabilities. Now, the Americans with Disabilities Act not only requires accessibility to buildings, but also to public transportation. And Austin's Capital Metro is the first transit authority in Texas to become 100% wheelchair accessible. It has come a long way. There's still a little ways, you know. There can always be some improvement, but compared to the old days, it, it's come a long way. The ADA to me does not mean only equal access, but it means independence from dependent. It gives us the opportunity to have jobs, live a meaningful life, help our country. There are 54 million children and adults with disabilities, as Governor Bush acknowledged in his proclamation. Our mission is to empower those folks. To have those 54 million is a lot of people. That's one in five people in the U.S. If we are united, if we're organized, if we're working together, there is nothing that we can't accomplish.
I'm very proud to be part of it. I'm very proud to represent the Texas Commission for the Blind. Uh, we're the agency that serves all blind and visually impaired people in Texas, and uh, it's a great teamwork effort here, and it's been real exciting. It means to me that I'm, I'm a person, not a, not a, not a, not a disability. When the bus driver told Rosa Parks to get to the back of the bus, that uh, December evening when she was coming home from work, she knew two things. She knew that she was tired in her bones for having to work all day. And she knew that she was tired in her spirit for having to carry 300 years of slavery and discrimination and racism on her back. And she knew then from that moment on, she was going to do everything she could to make things different. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. If Reverend Martin Luther King was here today, we believe he would also put forward that people should be judged not by their disabilities, but by their abilities. Created by the Austin Mayor's Committee on People with Disabilities, partnering organizations are listed.
Thank you all for hanging in there. We're wrapping it up now.